um, as a preliminary matter, this is the uh, November 12th, 2020 meeting of the Arlington School Committee. Uh, this meeting is conduct being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus in order to mitigate the transmission of the virus. We have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public meetings, gatherings, and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation. This meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note, that this meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All of the materials for this meeting except any executive session materials are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard. We recommend members of the public follow the agenda as posted unless I note otherwise. Um, I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude, I will go down the list of members. All vote taken to this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Um, and so let's do attendance and make sure everybody can hear me. Um, so members of the committee, Ms. Exton. Yes. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Not yet. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yep. Mr. Thielman. Here. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Good evening. Mr. Hainer. Hello. Hi. And um, Dr. Bodie. Present. Dr. McNeil. Here. Ms. Elmer. Here. Mr. Spiegel. Here. Mr. Mason. Here. Um, and um, so tonight, I hope I didn't miss anybody. I'm looking really quickly. Len just joined us. Excellent. Welcome, Mr. Cardin. Um, tonight, um, we have, and I think she's here. Yes, there she is. We have a new student rep um, to the school committee. Her name is Megan Carmody. She is a sophomore at Arlington High School. And I'm just going to give her a minute just to say hi to all of you before we move on. Uh, hi, I'm Megan. Uh, like she said, I'm a sophomore at Arlington High School, and I'm really excited to be here. Welcome. Thank you so much, Megan. And we also have this evening from the AEA tonight, uh, their newly elected vice vice president or vice chair, um, uh, Ms. Sif Ferranti. Hi, um, my name's C. Ferranti. It's pronounced, right. but uh, good to be here. Thank you. Um, and okay. We have Mr. Cardin. So we have four. Um, so the first item on the agenda is public comment. So a reminder for public comment that the um, each speaker is limited to three minutes. Um, and that as a matter of policy, the committee doesn't respond to public comment, but sometimes things that come up in public comment can either be directed to um, a subcommittee or you know, could be brought up later in the meeting. So the first person for public comment is Miss uh, Andrea Canty, Conti. Hi, it's Andrea Canty, can you Andrea? hear me? Yes. Hi, um, hello all, and thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. I had the pleasure of being included in a recent meeting with Dr. Janger about plans for the second semester at the high school. I appreciated the opportunity to provide feedback during and after the meeting. And while I understand the full report is not due until tomorrow, I wanted to share my thoughts with the school committee this evening. At the recent meeting, Dr. Janger shared two options that are under consideration for the second semester. I appreciate the hard work that was put into creating these hybrid choices, though I am left disheartened that our children at most will only receive 160 minutes per week of in-person learning. My concern is this does little to help with isolation and loneliness, nor does it do enough to combat the Zoom fatigue that many of our children are experiencing. 
Charlie Baker is asking all schools to return to classrooms full time. And while I realize that the high school is not ready for a full time in person experience, I do believe that the community of Arlington is creative and thoughtful enough to meet a difficult challenge and do better by our high schoolers. It is one of the reasons I love Arlington so much. On a final note, I have two seniors currently at AHS. So many of the AHS seniors feel forgotten with little to no acknowledgement of their losses. In addition to not being able to see their friends at school, they've lost their junior prom, group celebrations at football games, final homecoming, and countless other important milestones that many of us adults remember fondly and mark our high school years. After meeting with Dr. Janger, I proposed a committee with parents working with high school administration to come up with solutions to get the seniors together throughout the remainder of the school year. As an example, Newton South re recently held an outdoor drive-in movie night for just their seniors. If there is already such a committee, I ask that they begin to plan events to happen now rather than wait until the spring. And if a group does not already exist, I asked the school submit committee support my recommendation for a creation of a parent administration group for senior specific activities effective immediately. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, the next person is um, Anne Sokozensky. Ms. Sokozensky. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the chance to speak tonight. I'm the parent of a senior and I took part in one of the recent focus groups to discuss spring plans at the high school. I'm here tonight to add a parent perspective and draw attention to concerns about how all remote school is going and concerns about what we're hearing regarding plans for this spring. For the fall semester, Dr. Janger shared that attendance is at 99%. Reverse field trips are creating in-person options, and there's a comparable incidence of mental health issues now compared to pre-COVID. The 99% attendance rate is really commendable because it's a testament to the hard work of APS in making sure that all students have access to resources to connect to the all remote model. But we also have to recognize that attendance only measures how many students are checking in at the beginning of classes it doesn't measure the percentage of students who are able to engage really effectively with the online teaching. As for the reverse field trips, my own student has had access to only one of those in the past seven weeks since school started. The incidence of mental health issues is a key metric. It's not clear how this is being measured in Arlington, but national measures indicate that the reduced access to in-person school during COVID has had a dramatic effect on teenagers' mental health and their loneliness. And it seems likely that if Arlington is not seeing this, we're probably not looking in the right ways. The spring semester plans that we saw at the focus group included a four cohort model that brings students into school only one morning per week. That was the best scenario presented. The other two plans were only a small step above the current reverse field trip model and may only include in-person options for core subjects at the high school. It's really important to note that most seniors take very few core subjects in the second half of senior year. So those latter plans might give seniors little or no access to in-person options. As, as Andrea noted, seniors stand to lose the most in the current situation. Many of us parents heard at the curriculum night that if we can just get through this incredibly difficult period, we'll have a beautiful new building to occupy. The class of 2021 will never set foot in that new building. And many of them feel forgotten by the town at this time. This is such a critical time for them, not only academically, but also because they're processing and planning for the end of their secondary education. And all of those little small informal discussions they usually have at school with other students and teachers are fundamental in helping them through this key life transition. The most important thing I wanna to say tonight is this, whether or not there's a viable in-person option for all students next semester, I ask that the administration and school committee make plans that prioritize giving seniors tangible in-person experiences. Here are just a few things AHS could plan for the spring. Create in-person advisory for seniors on Wednesdays. Give upperclassmen some access to the visual and performing arts spaces. Facilitate socially distanced in-person study groups or peer support groups. 
and include electives in any hybrid plan that moves forward. Please know that many parents are willing to work collaboratively to make these plans a reality. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the next person is uh, Mr. Thomas Davison. Hi, Mr. Davison, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear? Oh, there we go. Hi, hi, sorry, I had a, I'm, I'm mute. So, um, hi, my name is uh, Tom Davison. I'm a father with a freshman and a senior at Arlington High School. And I want to say uh, the two previous speakers, um, Anne and Andrea, this isn't a planned senior slam on you, but I'm also here to talk about, about seniors. I think that just speaks to how, how many of us who have seniors that are thinking the same way. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the school administration and the school committee members for all the work you're doing. I understand these are very difficult circumstances. And I'm here tonight to speak to ask that you make a plan to bring back at least the senior class for the spring semester at AHS. It's great that we've shown in our elementary and middle schools that we can safely hold classes in those buildings. And I understand regarding the high school that the ventilation issues led to us being fully remote this fall. I was encouraged in the October school committee meeting when Dr. Chang reported that there were, I believe he said, 30 classrooms that had breaking ventilation, that the prognosis was good, that ventilation could be prepared in more classrooms. And then in addition, that the red and blue gyms, old hall, the pit, the auditorium and the cafeteria, I believe he said, were all usable spaces. We all wanna bring back all the students into the building. And I understand there are challenges to do. To, to doing that. None of us know what the COVID-19 situation will be in the spring, but looking ahead, um, one, I really want to hear what Dr. Jagger's upcoming report will be on the high school facilities and the possible options for, for the spring. But all that said, with the spaces that we do have, and I think in the comment that Dr. Jagger said last school committee meeting that if the school committee were to ask to bring back the senior class that the facilities were there to make that happen, I ask that you make that plan, that you put that plan in place to bring back at least the full senior class for the spring. I'm not throwing my freshman son under the bus, nor the rest of the underclassmen under the bus, but I will agree with what the two previous speakers said, and it's the first time I've heard their comments, but I do believe emotionally and socially, it matters more for our seniors to bring them back into the school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Diane Gardner. Hi, my name is Diane Gardner. I'm a Wellington High School parent and I thank you for the chance to speak tonight. I would like to read the, petition, the following petitions signed by 244 Arlington community members, including parents and students requesting that the Arlington Public Schools present the school committee with one or more workable hybrid models for a safe return to in-person learning. Please note that this petition circulated before Dr. Janger's focus groups over the last week. I do have a list of signatures as well as comments that I can submit if desired. Um, the petition reads, Dear Dr. Janger, Dr. Bodie, and members of the Arlington School Committee, the undersigned Arlington families urge you in the strongest possible terms to do whatever is necessary to provide safe in-person learning options beyond the burdensome Band-Aid solution of reverse field trips for Arlington students in grades nine through 12 for second semester. We understand that the constraints imposed by COVID-19 have required a balancing of interests, prioritization of needs, and acceptance of less than ideal arrangements for the school year. And we believe that the needs and interests of Arlington High School students have not been prioritized appropriately. The district's current approach disregards the clear priority that the community put on in-person learning. Based on family input, the school committee approved a hybrid learning plan for the district. This is because school is not only about instruction, it is also important to see friends, to be together with other students in a learning environment, and to feel part of a community. Not creating a feasible hybrid learning plan for grades nine through 12 is inequitable. Most students in the district have been afforded a hybrid option. Families of current AHS students have accepted that there would be disruption during the, due to the new building construction but it is grossly unfair not to make the efforts and improvements necessary to use current facilities for a hybrid model merely because of the future de demolition. This prioritizes other interests over those of current students and we feel our community is better than that. Most importantly, 
and all remote academic year is unhealthy for many of our children. It's bad for teens to be isolated at home every day for months on end. The mental health of our students is suffering and an option for in-person learning would help. Families at all grade levels should be able to choose either re all remote or hybrid based on what they believe is best for their students and families' needs. It is up to the school committee, not APS administrators, to balance needs and interests and decide on the best school, high school approach given constraints. To do this, they need options. We believe that some form of hybrid is achievable. While a plan to bring students into the building part-time may imp impact instructional instructional time, it would elevate students' mental health and social and emotional needs. It may not be what the administration recommends and that of course should be considered, but a workable hybrid model or hybrid options should be developed so that the Arlington community through its elected representatives can have the choice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. If you could um, send the petition and signatures to our recording secretary uh, at Kay Fitzgerald, or you can email me and I can get it to her, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, sure thing. Thank you. Okay, um, so the first agenda item, we have two. Um, so the first agenda item is an update on the superintendent search process. Um, when we last met, we approved the recommendation from the superintendent search screening committee of two finalists, and they have been scheduled to come uh, virtually to Arlington for much of next week. So um, on Tuesday and uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, they will meet um, with uh, principals, assistant principals, um, students. Uh, curriculum leaders, teachers, um, and then there will be a community meeting in the evening for uh, parents, guardians, members of the community who are able to join. And Tuesday and Wednesday will be one for each candidate. They will sort of mirror each other. And then on Thursday and Friday evening, um, the school committee will have an opportunity to interview uh, each candidate one on each night in one of our uh, meetings, which is also of course, open to the public. Um, I've worked with our search consultant um, as well as our administrative uh, assistant, Ms. Fitzgerald, to get these set up. We're pretty close, um, making sure that we have the right Zoom meetings to accommodate um, all of the teachers and staff who want to attend. That's critical, obviously, um, as well as the evening. Um, I am going to uh, moderate the community session in the evening with Ms. Exton. She volunteered uh, for both evenings. Um, Ms. Juliana Keys, who is the president of the AEA, will moderate the session with the teachers. And we have two Arlington High School students who will moderate respectively each one of the um, student sessions. So um, it's gonna be a busy week. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot going on. Um, so from the committee, I wanted to, um, oh, and the other update is that um, it was suggested that we, uh, or that I evaluate whether there was interest in uh, providing an opportunity for members, uh, for uh, town of Arlington employees and members of town boards like the Finance Committee, uh, the Capital Planning Committee, the Human Rights Commission have an opportunity to meet uh, the candidates and provide their feedback as well. Um, so I think that is gonna be scheduled on the Monday of the subsequent week and likely in shorter sessions uh, back to back so that we can fit that in. It's extraordinarily challenging to do all of this with town meeting concurrently running. Um, that takes a lot of us out from eight until 11 Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, and for those of us who attended the dress rehearsal earlier this week, I think it became very clear that uh, town meeting could, could take a little while to uh, dispense of its agenda. So it's, it's uncertain when it will end. Um, and we have Thanksgiving. So, but I think we're in good shape in terms of the nuts and bolts of getting this scheduled and um, sorted out. So that, that there were a couple of things, I'm happy to take feedback obviously from the committee about that. The two things that I was looking for feedback for is in Novus, there is a sample um, feedback form that we would provide. Um, I need to let Mr. Kucher know if 
if we're comfortable with that um, so that that can be done, I need to let him know that uh, tomorrow <laughs> so that it can be put together tomorrow. So if there is feedback on the survey, I'd like to get that from people tonight. Um, and the other thing that I think we need to discuss because this is our only chance to do so is how we're going to, how people want to structure next Thursday and Friday. Um, I'll be honest, as chair, I'm fairly agnostic about how we do it. I'm happy to run the interviews in whatever way members feel you know, comfortable, um, but I would like to have a sense of how we're gonna structure that just so that I know and we all know, you know what we're going into because it's not obviously gonna be our typical agenda meeting. So can we do, is there any comments on the feedback form first? So the intent of the form would be to provide uh, one link for each candidate to all, um, all to everybody, right? And, and with the hopes that um, people would self-identify as a you know teacher or staff or you know community member, parent, what have you, um, and then they would answer questions about about both candidates, and then the committee would have that feedback. So any feedback on that first, Mr. Hainer. Just a question on, on uh, procedure. When the feedback is given, I assume Mr. Kuchner's group will put it together and compile it and present it to us, the committee? Correct. Correct. And will, will we have that prior to our meeting uh, with the candidates? So will that uh, follow for us to be to digest that plus our meeting to make our decision? Right. So the issue is, I think that um, in order to accommodate as in order to provide as many people with the opportunity to get, you know, to get a sense of the candidates, um, you know, we need to keep the we need to keep the feedback open because some people so there will be faculty members, for example, who are unable to attend the afternoon sessions that we've set up for, for teachers and staff for whatever reason, but they may be able to attend and watch either the community meeting on Wednesday night, or they may choose to watch our interviews with the candidates on Thursday and Friday and, 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 you know, and provide their feedback there. So I don't, I, I can't tell you because we have to really keep it open through when town boards meet on, um, on Monday, the 23rd. So no, we won't, we won't have that before we interview them. So we, so they'll be doing this. We will be doing our interviewing, compiling all this material. We will get a chance to digest all this together, and then we will do our own deliberation. Is that is that sound right on a timeline? Yes. Yeah, so the, right now, what we have on the schedule is we have a meeting for all of us to meet on the twenty fourth, which is the subsequent Tuesday. But as we said, whenever we last met three weeks ago, two weeks ago, I don't know, last year, um, we. Uh, <laughs> We, we didn't, I, we sort of put that meeting on the books, but I, I see that as more of a sort of pulse taking of where we're at at okay. that time. How are we feeling? What are we doing? Do we have what we need? Because we can't, you know, as, as we all know, we cannot meet in any other forum than this one. Right. So um, by having that meeting on the books, it allows us to at least come here on Zoom and make sure that we're having a conversation just like this. I, I, right. I personally don't expect it to be a hugely deliberative meeting because I don't think we're going to have all the stuff that we need. Um, but, you know, I think we, I like having it on the books, especially because I think we could still be in town meeting. Um, so that way we can at least see where we're at. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, the Tuesday meeting, why? Do you think we won't have everything we need at that point? Uh, because I think the earliest we'll be able to schedule town employees, finance committee, capital planning, et cetera, is gonna be on the Monday uh, from some period of time before town meeting likely starts. So we will not have their feedback. We'll obviously know what, you know, I would expect that we will have feedback from all of the Arlington Public Schools people who are slated for Tuesday and Wednesday 
of next week, right? I think we'll have feedback from teachers and students and administration. Um, and then we'll, you know, we'll know what we think after our, um, after our interviews on Thursday and Friday. Um, I guess I was hoping for faster turnaround than, than it sounds like what you were hoping for. So that, that's all. Well, I will tell you as somebody who has spent the better part of this last week trying to schedule all of these pieces one right after another, I would love to have faster turnaround as well, but there are literally not enough hours in the day to make this happen because of town meeting meeting concurrently. We Monday night and Wednesday night are totally out um, later in the evening. And so, you know, I, I think that we'll have the vast majority of the feedback in you know, Friday night and over that weekend. Um, so I was it. I was. This was by no means mm -hmm. a criticism or anything implied by you. I think you have done an amazing job, and that we all owe you a tremendous and and Miss Fitzgerald too tremendous accommodation for for doing this. Um, I meant that it seemed like it's just gathering the town stuff from the day and that our consultant could isn't in town meeting and could get it together so we would have that last bit of feedback so that we would not be waiting on stuff but i think it's reasonable to expect that we we will have the feedback from um you know anybody on the town side that chooses that elects to provide it after their uh 1123 meeting by the morning of the 24th that's my intention um so you know i think we were we were shooting for i think we put up for 6 30 on the 24th so you know for those who have who are able to sift through that um, i mean my intention is to provide the committee with you know as much in whatever form it is easily accessible to people so that they can see, you know, all of it, right? I mean, it's going to be, given the format of the survey, it's largely narrative. Well, I mean, it's entirely narrative, right? So it's gonna be a question, and I, I don't know how much people are gonna write or share. Um, so yeah, I think it's, I think we will have the bulk of it by the end of, you know, by the end of Friday for, to review over the weekend and then whatever comes in after Mondays session will be able to look at or some people may be able to look at before Tuesday night. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Uh, Ms. Morgan, thank you. Um, so just to summarize, we're still holding the 24th for a meeting at the, at six, the regular time, 632, whenever. <clears throat> Are we going to be conducting any regular business after the interview on the 19th? After the interview on the 19th, no. So our next regular business meeting where we can respond to the high school report and all that stuff will be not until um, December 10th? So I think that was one of the things that I had on my list to talk about with everybody tonight. Okay. I think that we could choose um, to, and again, I'm I'm trying to, you know, res we've there have been members who have said, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to do anything but no. blank, right? Which is fine. Um, so we could elect on the 24th, which is a, I mean, it's a special school committee meeting, but it is, you know, it's, it could, there's no reason that we can't take up both, you know, issues related to the high school, um, as well as a temperature check, you know, planning for where we're at um, in the superintendent process. I don't have a problem with that, obviously, um, and I'm happy to do that. I just want, you know, I want buy-in from everybody that that's what we want to do. I, I would be comfortable with that, but I can't speak for the rest of the group. So that's where I, you know, so I don't know. That's where I would, I would be comfortable. I would just, it, it's going to be a long time to go from <clears throat> a report we receive on the 13th on the high school, a CIA meeting next Wednesday, I guess it is, to December 10th, um, which is basically a month from today. So uh, I would just propose that I'm comfortable with the 24th. I cannot speak for everybody on the committee. And I certainly agree that the superintendent's election is highly, is a big deal. I'm not, I'm not minimizing that anyway. Thank you. Um, Ms. Exton, you had your hand up earlier, or was it Mr. Cardin? You guys are both wearing the same color tonight, so. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm obviously a very color oriented person. Was it you, Ms. Exton, or was it you, Mr. Cardin? I think we both had our hands up. Okay, so Ms. Exton, go ahead. Sorry. Um, have we, were you able to get any more information about being able to do something in person safely and publicly? And is that something that we would discuss on the 24th if we felt like it was something we still needed to do? I guess I'm just wondering where, where it, we are. So where we punted after three weeks ago, we sort of punted to tonight to figure out, do we, you know, we can meet in person. We can like, we can use the school committee room as long as it's only the seven of us and the candidate. And I provide um, various charts and graphs and maps to the uh, director of health and human services as is appropriate. Um, so that's absolutely something we can do. It's not been scheduled, um, obviously. So I, you know, we can make a decision tonight if that's what people want to do. I mean, it's this is it's kind of what we're here to decide to do, right? I mean, I would like to meet them in person. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I, I I'm agnostic as to how we do that. I'm happy to to schedule it. Um, I know that when we met last time, Mr. Thielman said and and others seem to agree that you know obviously conducting the interviews would be easier over zoom just because we wouldn't need to be um you know we wouldn't need we wouldn't have masks on and we would be you know in this sort of forum that we're actually all have become a little used to but um so yeah i mean if if this is what people want to do i guess i just need to know what i should set up i mean at this point realistically it's not going to be until after thanksgiving I don't think, I don't see any way that we would be able to do it between now and then realistically. Yeah, and I, I agree with Mr. Thielman from the previous meeting too, that I think the interview in this forum is is much better, but I, you know, you know, this is someone that hopefully is going to be a part of Arlington for longer than COVID. And so, you know, I feel like as much for them to be able to come and see Arlington and for us to, to meet this person in, in real life as much as it's feasible. Maybe it's something that after the interviews and the community meetings, we meet on the 20 that Tuesday and feel like it's necessary or not necessary, but I just want to make sure it's something that we're still talking about. Um, Mr. Cardin. Thanks. Um, so I was going to just ask about the the work that um, MASC is doing with the feedback form, um, the goal is not really to, to produce a report like the focus group report where they kind of digested things. Is that, I mean, because I think we, we all are going to go through it in granular detail anyway. So I, I don't want to wait for them to sort of sift through it because we're going to do that on our own. My expectation is that they're going to provide us access to de facto the raw data, which is the narrative feedback by candidate by question. So no, I, I'm not uh, I'm not expecting anything written from them and I don't see why we can't have access to it as it comes in. Um, I just need to, you know, I need to confirm that with them. But yeah, no, there, I don't think there's gonna be any compiling really needed. I think they can just provide us access to it. We're, I mean, I think we're generally interested in the, the broad demographic categories and then the narrative feedback given who is providing it. That's, that's been the sense that I, I got the last time that we met. Great. So I think we're. Great. My, my other comment is that it would I have a slight preference to sort of sort out a more firm schedule than just sort of having this temperature check idea for the 24th. Um, I mean, based on the the schedule and not being able to meet them in person before that, um, you know, maybe it's just another meeting to plan for the rest of the process. Um, I I don't know, or maybe I, Paul Paul has some ideas. So I, I I'm I'm just a little bit queasy with with the uncertainty. Agreed, me too. So that's that's why we're here. I I would like to. I would like to have clear direction at the end of this conversation and I'm happy to implement as 
as people wish. We could we could certainly meet in person with candidates on the 24th, the evening of the 24th, if that's you know if that's where we want to go. Um, Mr. Schuchman. Uh, I prefer queasy actually. Um, after the two interviews, we'll have something of a sense of how much thought and research we want to do. Uh, we may want to do site visits based on what we've seen. We might not. We might be really interested in one candidate more than another. We might not. I think that we need to be open for uh, uh, whatever evidence we collect over the next week in terms of uh, watching the community response and, and, and responses to our interviews. So it could go in one of many directions. Uh, I would not be available to do in person on the 24th anyway. Um, so I, I think that once we figure out what we want to do, we can use the 24th uh, to deliberate and make a decision as to how much more research and depth do we wanna do? Uh, do we wanna meet with both candidates? Do we wanna do a virtual site visit for both candidates? Uh, what is so we would be reacting to to next week's uh, interviews and and feedback. That's why there this needs to be an open book rather than a locked in schedule. Mr. Hainer, I apologize at the outset by adding more to the table, but I would go along with Mr. Thielman. I don't want to wait until December to deal with the. Uh, the report that's coming out. Uh, and I, I don't wanna speak for the other five members, but uh, I would like to possibly find some time on the 24th uh, to deal with, uh, to, to look at that and discuss that as well. So, so I don't know if you wanna discuss. Go ahead, yeah. I don't know if you wanna discuss that now or in a different, sort of a different agenda item, but. I mean, they're all, it's all gonna be, yeah, it's all going to be sort of wrapped in. I mean, I think if we have, you know, it, it sounds like in person on the 24th isn't an option for Mr. Schlickman. So that's off, which is fine. Um, so that leaves uh, Ms. Exton and others. I share her request of, you know, planning for in person would be a post Thanksgiving thing um, at this point, given where we're at. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm still. You know, I think we're still, the other thing that we need to deal with as part of this agenda item is how we want to format our interviews for, uh, for next week. So I'm not sure what people's thoughts are about that. So let's, so, so we're going to meet on the 24th. I mean, we can, you know, we can have two agenda items. One is the AHS report and the other one is, you know, continued discussions around the superintendent search. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I, I, I don't, I don't know where we will realistically, I, I find it very hard to project where we're going to be by, you know, 10 days from now, I guess that's where I'm struggling. Um, so Mr. Cardin, if you were looking for something more structured, which I appreciate. No, 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 that's, that's fine. I, I, I take Mr. Schuchman's comments <clears throat> and uh, that, that's fine. I, I understand where he's coming from and, and I that that's a, okay with me. Um, on the high school though, I wanted to just note that I don't anticipate CIAA be completing its work by the 24th for sure. I mean, the committee can always uh, discuss the matter, but um, certainly the idea that, I mean, it, it could certainly be a, a point of discussion and, and a time if, if Dr. Jenger is available to ask questions. I don't even know if he's available then. Um, but I, uh, I anticipate CIA doing a couple weeks of work before having a report come to the committee uh, and a decision point. Mr. Dillman. Can I just uh, clarify? Thank you, Mr. Cardin. Uh, the report is coming to us from Dr. Jenger on the 13th. Do you have a, you're scheduling a CIA meeting on the 19th. Do I have that correct? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's the 18th, but yes. Okay, the, the 18th. Wednesday, the 18th, thank you. He's, the principal will be at that meeting with the committee. Um, and, <clears throat> okay, we, we and you, 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 in the committee may wanna do more research and more uh, evaluation. 
before making a recommendation to the full committee and won't be ready until probably December 10th to make a recommendation? Is that what you're pr projecting? Uh, I'm not sure because I don't know what's in Dr. Jenger's report besides the uh, the few comments we had earlier to this evening. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I do think it's going to, um, especially with Thanksgiving, um, that sounds realistic. We can, you know, certainly try to push earlier, but um, uh, I, I think it's going to take till December 10th to get all the information we need. Okay. So I guess I the question that I put to you, Mr. Cardin, is, is it helpful or a hindrance to you um, in the work your subcommittee is doing to meet, um, to, to talk about the high school on the 24th? Uh, I think it partly depends on what the report says tomorrow. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's definitely worth having a, a conversation. I mean, uh, maybe the, um, the options are not sufficient. Maybe the information is not sufficient. Um, that's certainly something that CIA will look at. But um, uh, if the full committee, you know, wants to make that determination as well, that that would be something to discuss. So I guess can I suggest a way out of our <laughs> out of our conundrum would be, you know, we're we only need to post the agenda 48 hours in advance, right? So if CIA meets on Wednesday, I guess what I would ask you, Mr. Cardin, is for your you and your subcommittee to uh, make a recommendation as to whether or not the full committee take up the high school. We're going to keep our 1124 meeting regardless. We need to come in and see where we're at with the superintendent search. Um, so I am happy to add the high school to that agenda if it is helpful to the work your subcommittee is doing and will continue to move you forward and potentially provide you with more time to meet that is already structured. If not, then we will just take up the you know where we're at with the superintendent. Does that seem reasonable, Mr. Thielman? Yeah, let me just suggest this. The subcommittees were formed many years ago to do the kind of due diligence that Mr. Cardin is suggesting. At the same time, this is a report that is of interest to the whole school committee. So what I would suggest is on the 24th, we have an agenda item and Mr. D Dr. Janger comes to the meeting to answer questions from all members of the school committee. Mr. Cardin, as the chair of the Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Subcommittee, can say in that meeting, I'd like to hold off on making any motion at this time until the subcommittee can do further research, but that meeting on the 24th gives the full school committee the opportunity to interview the super, the principal and ask him questions, and all of us should be afforded that opportunity, whether we can attend the full curriculum meeting or not. So I would put that on the agenda. I would inform Dr. Janger that he's to be there on the 24th at the time we specify, and we have a discussion about it. Dr. Allison Ampey? I was going to suggest it be put on the agenda on the 24th, no matter what, just in case we had, it would provide us the opportunity to ask questions if needed. Um, I'm not, I think the CIA could be seen as a committee of the whole um, and I'm not sure that we have to have the school committee provide the opportunity. I think CIA could provide the opportunity if necessary, um, but, I think it should be on our agenda on the 24th, just in case there's any turning points, that, decisions that we need to make. Mr. Thielman. Yes, that's true, what Dr. Kersey, what Dr. Allison Ampey said, but it's not always possible for everybody to make the subcommittee meeting. And so that's just not how it works. It's a matter of, it's a matter of importance for the entire school committee. It's ultimately a decision the entire school committee has to make. So he can come to the meeting on the 24th. And I, I'd like him there. Yep, I will, I will follow up. So where we're at right now, we seem to have uh, some agreement around the uh, survey. We have some agreement or most agree, mostly agreement around what we're gonna do on the 24th. Um, and so next, the last thing we need to do as part of this item is figure out what we're gonna do next Thursday and Friday. We're working backwards. So we're now at the most, like, so, so there have been a couple of suggested formats for how to run these interviews. Um, I believe it was Mr. Schlickman presented a format where each member was afforded 10 minutes to have a conversation. Um, I believe Mr. Thielman uh, suggested at least two rounds so that there was another opportunity to do follow-up at the end. 
Um, you know, I, I, there's been suggestions to go, we could go in alphabetical order, we can go in our normal order. Um, I'm fine with whatever we do. Um, but I do want there to be general buy in for how this is going to work, we need to do it the same way on Thursday as we do it on Friday. So um, I want to make sure that we're all as comfortable as we can be going into Thursday so that we can replicate it on Friday. So I think because, so the initial suggestion was, you know, 10, 10 minutes per person um, and then a follow-up of five minutes. Is that, was that what you, is that where we were at the last time? So let's start with that as a baseline and then comment from there. Mr. Hainer. I support what you just presented. Uh, the order, you, I'll leave it to you to put there. The ones you like, you can send them first and go from there. Well, I think I would do it in the order that we always do things in. Um, I would maybe, um, I would maybe shuffle it up for the last, for the five minutes. I think it's, I think being first and last are the harder places to be, frankly, so. Um, but I will, um, I'll come up with something and make sure that everybody knows well in advance so that they can prepare. So if we do 10 minutes, 10, 70, 5, 35, that gives us almost two hours, right? It'll be two hours. Thoughts? And then the idea would be that, that members would come up with their own, you know, their own questions. Um, I don't know if there's a way for us to share those with each other in advance. Um, probably not really. So I suppose those of us, I, let's, let's assume that for the first, let's assume for both rounds, we'll go in our regular, um, the regular order that we go in. So Ms. Exton, you're gonna get first crack. The advantage is that nobody will ask your question before you get to. <laughs> um, and then those of us at the end may be making some edits and adjustments um, if we wanna touch on something different. Does that seem reasonable to everybody? And then we'll go back with a five minute. Um, so, so Ms. Exton will ask her questions and then she will be able to watch, or, and Mr. Cardin, because they're both early, um, they, she, they will be able to watch all of the responses to the rest of us as we ask our insightful probing questions. Um, and then they will, they will have five minutes, uh, you know, we'll come back and people will have five minutes to ask any follow-up questions. Mr. Cardin. So just as far as the order, I was going to volunteer at, at having served on the search committee and seen, you know, the the candidates and also had a chance to submit questions. Um, I'm happy to go later in the process. And I don't know if that's true of my other fellow members, but um, it may make sense for those who have not had a chance to ask a question to go earlier. Oh, I kind of like that. That changes things up a little bit. Um, so that would be uh, Exton, Thielman, Hayner, Morgan, Cardin, Dr. Allison Ampey, and Mr. Schlickman. Yes, that seems great. I like things that are a little different. Dr. Allison Ampey. For the search committee, we were able to have the consultant um, compile a list of questions. I'm wondering if I can ask Mr. Schlickman through the chair if that's possible. I mean, I think we can ask him to do whatever we want. Um, I think it's, um, I, I think we certainly could. Um, ask, you know, if, if people want to be locked in to what they're going to ask about. I think that's the downside. Mr. Schlickman. I don't want to be locked in because I think that was one of the handicaps of the first round interview is we we're all sort of locked into our question. The goal here is to be more conversational. However, I don't know if this full committee has gotten the, there, there's a list of about 150 questions that are typical for superintendent interviews. Uh, and I don't know if the full committee has gotten that. Uh, the search screening committee got a look at the uh, typical questions so that we could have that as a reference 
and people can just sort of use that as a, as a starting point for thinking about what kind of questions they might want to a, a, want, might want to ask. I mean, I mean, I certainly would want to get into a conversation about things like public governance, budgeting, relations with town meeting. You know, a lot of the things that, uh, in my mind, that we didn't see in the first round. But uh, uh, I think that the more informal and relaxed it is in terms of the conversation, we're going to learn more than than the rigid style that we had previously. And you saw the questions that we asked at the last. Uh, session so so you know that that's ground that has been covered mr schlickman could you provide to us through karen the list of you know that like sort of exhausted lists of many uh questions uh it's possible we've been sent it before but i can't put my hands on it right now so i would be grateful if you could get us that yeah okay uh uh if if i don't do it uh tonight or tomorrow send me a reminder and i'll do it because uh my screens are all locked up. All right, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I, I would. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not in favor of sending. I'm trying to coordinate the questions. I, I think I wa I've watched the videos and the questions were fine. Uh, I think if you if you prepare for an interview like this, you should zero. I, I'm going to zero in. I'm, I can't tell what everyone else is going to do, but I'm going to zero in on where I have doubts about each of the candidates, and those are going to be the sources of my questions. And so I think everyone. And I think to kind of reveal that, I, I think people should, that's that's one way to approach it. That's how I might approach it if I were guiding somebody on this. All right, so we're clear on the format. We're clear broadly on the plan for the 24th. Um, if you have questions, let me know. I see your hand, Mr. Schlickman. Um, I will make sure that we have the meeting set up on the 23rd for, uh, for the town governance side, um, and we'll go from there. All right, Mr. Schuchman. Uh, one other thing, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that both candidates by virtue of their resume has presented MCAS scores to their respective school committees in, in the form of a PowerPoint. And if we could ask the candidates to provide that. I will uh, put that out to Mr. Kucher and see mm -hmm. what he can do. All right, um, Mr. Hainer. Uh, just, just a, a reminder, this is a long process for these people to go through and sit through. Uh, I would advise, suggest that we have some sort of break for all the members, especially some of the senior members, me, uh, to take a break in the middle of this at different times, uh, just so we can all breathe. That sounds Thank like you. a good idea. If I forget, Mr. Heiner, I know you'll remind me. That's the I'll be doing this. That's right. So you can hold up a picture of a toilet. Okay. Um, all right. Anything else on this item? Seeing none. So the next one is um, the evaluation process for Superintendent Bodie from 2019 2020. Um, we, I put in Novus what I am suggesting we use to complete her evaluation. Um, it is the three uh, first pages of the traditional form that we have used. It's significantly truncated. It only provides one spot where it asks for us to provide narrative feedback. Um, and then instead of doing the various like sub, um, what I can't even remember what they're called, but the sub pieces, we would uh, do an assessment on professional practice, uh, student learning, uh, we didn't actually have a district improvement goal, so um, that I would remove. And then we would rank her, we would uh, evaluate her on the four standards, provide an overall uh, summative performance, and then uh, write whatever narrative comments we so choose chose to do. Um, so this is instead of using the seven or eight page evaluation that required narrative comments on many pages. I thought this was um, an efficient way for us to do this at this point. I'd like to finish it this calendar year before we leave for the winter vacation. Um, Dr. Bodhi would provide us with a um, with her self-evaluation, which would be in narrative format. Those of us who have done this before are familiar 
with that. Um, and then we would do our evaluation and uh, wrap that up um, for the November, uh, the December 17th committee meeting. Um, so on, on the form, is there any, is there any, um, are there any questions or concerns about using this version of the form? Ms. Exton. Um, thank you, sir. Since this is, this process is new for me um, and I came onto the committee sort of at the end of the last school year, um, does Dr. Bodhi provide evidence towards these or is it sort of like the evidence is gathered over the course of the school committee meetings? How does that? So it's a great question. It was the next thing I was going to bring up. So typically we do do a, a large scale gathering of evidence. There's a lot of documentation, hundreds, thousands, maybe of pages of documentation that are updated into Novus that we use to produce the evaluations. Um, I, I was going to suggest um, given what else we have going on and where we're at in this evaluation process that we significantly reduce, if not almost entirely eliminate the, the process of collecting that evidence, just in that it's extremely time consuming for um, both Dr. Bodhi and her administrative secretary and ours, given what else we have going on right now. Um, but I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure where the committee was at with that. I can absolutely understand why it would be tremendous, it would be difficult to do this evaluation um, without, um, without having a lot of that. So I, I guess that's, that's sort of the question, right? It's that balance between what do we need to fulfill this requirement of our policy um, and um, what do we, you know, what do we realistically want? What do we really, really absolutely need in order to be able to do this? So are there any other, so those of us who have done this before, is any, can anybody speak to what you feel like you would need to, to, to wrap this up? Mr. Thielman. The answer Ms. Exton, yes, you said, uh, Ms. Exton, we usually get a lot more evidence, um, but this is a different year. This last year of a contract. I mean, I think, my suggestion would be if, if people feel they need more information, um, maybe they could uh, send their comp their questions to Dr. Bodie by a date certain, um, and then get that information. So some of the um, some of the intent of the you know the district goals presentations and the PowerPoint that Dr. McNeil put together, and we heard from some curriculum leaders three weeks ago. Some of the intent of that is that you know obviously you know Dr. Bodie's um, her, you know, performance on the standards is sort of tied to, to district goals, right? Um, and, and, you know, she does have two, she has two specific goals, right? The professional practice goal, which is around the high school, um, and the transition and phasing plans. Of course, when we wrote this, we didn't understand even remotely the full extent to which uh, she would ex be expected to come up with transitional and phasing plans for uh, all students, um, as well as the student learning goal around um, you know, benchmark reading. I do think that we, for the student learning goal, I do think that we've heard a fair amount. We did hear from, um, from Ms. Perry a few weeks ago. So I, I personally feel like I'm sort of in a place where I could evaluate on the, the professional practice and the student learning goals fairly effectively. Um, but I, I guess I would agree in, in other than doing a huge data collection effort that um, some of us may not be in a position to fully sift through, um, I would be inclined to go with Mr. Thielman's recommendation that if, if there are members who need um, help with the four standards um, that they, you know, that they reach out to Dr. Bodhi. If that's, are you comfortable with that, Dr. Bodhi? I'm new. Uh, yes, I'm very comfortable with that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, and uh, for Ms. Exton, uh, new members who are on a committee less than a year uh, often recuse themselves from part or all of the evaluation. So uh, 
do what you what do what you feel is right and do what you how you want to communicate and don't worry about it. Um, Mr. Cardin and then Mr. Hainer. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I, I was just going to suggest that you that somebody also send around the full form because those four standards um, that uh, that we need to rate on are more are more flushed out in the rest of the form. We don't need to fill out the rest of the form, um, but there are a lot of subcategories for each of those standards. Um, so it's helpful to understand what those what's meant by management and operations if you look at the full form. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so yes, that's super doable. Um, Dr. Bodhi, do you think that you will be able to provide if we're, um, I, I'm creating a sort of end of 2020, like deadline artificially, just it's in my own mind, I'd like to get this done. Um, so that would put us at the meeting on December 17th. Is there a reasonable time between now and giving us some time to fill out this form that you could get us your self evaluation? Um, yes, um, I believe I can probably do that by the Thanksgiving break or right after it. Okay, I, I mean, I don't know that we even need it that soon, but or yeah, that, okay. right, how about December 1st? Sure. December 5th, yeah. Okay, great. So the plan will be that um, Karen will get you guys, will get us the forms, um, we'll have those. Dr. Bodhi will give us her narrative if there are questions around the standards that people need clarification on, they should follow up with Dr. Bodhi. Um, we will plan to fill out the first three um, pages of our regular CBIE uh, summative evaluation report. Great, all right. Uh, Mr. Hainer, sorry. No, just going back to the format, uh, once we've got all this information, we're all satisfied, we've done our writing and everything. Are we turning uh, a copy of this into you for you to put a, a compilation together and do the uh, reporting? And in the past we've done, I'll be honest with you, I don't remember ever doing it the same way twice when we do the report. Last year, if, if and I'll ask the members to correct me, the chair did a summ summative or a compilation. And then we, those of us that wanted to uh, did an added piece. Is that how you intend on doing it or is that up for discussion? Uh, that is also up for discussion if people would like to discuss it. I mean, I was, I figured, I think we need to produce one. Um, I, I'm not sure what we're obligated to do by policy. I know we need to produce one sort of comp. The state, re the state ha requires one compilation of the uh, of it together. And that's why the chair uh, did the compilation. We right. got a chance to see it. If we had any question about it, we could we could uh, respond back to the chair. I will plan to do that. And then anybody who would like to read their narrative um, comments of any length can plan, <coughs> excuse me, to do so on the 17th. But I remind people that you need to read what you have written on the, you need to read what you actually put on the eval. You can't go, uh, you can't go rogue on the 17th. Thank you. Okay, um, are we done with this? I'm done. Great, okay. Um, so the next item is the approval of the traffic supervisors uh, and cafeteria food service MOAs. Um, Mr. Spiegel. So we've, um, these MOAs were uh, reached through negotiations with the local 680 who represents the traffic and food service um, regarding specifically focused on the Wednesdays uh, when many of the, uh, the traffic supervisors are not working this year and um, not as many food service are, although um, there are some opportunities for food service to work on Wednesdays. So that's basically what it, um, some of the, the changes that happened this year for those uh, agreements, them, those MOAs. Um, did you have questions about them? Uh, questions, um, Mr. Hainer. 
Uh, item number three on the MOA for the uh, cafeteria. It talks about uh, the right to file unemployment. Did I misunderstand that? I thought they that was an issue. So, uh, you know, I think they, they can file, they can try. I don't know necessarily if they're only losing less than 25% of their well, weekly income if they would qualify. I guess my question is, it's in one MOA, it's not in the other MOA. And that was the major thing for the both MOAs was the Wednesday issue. Yeah. So shouldn't there be some consistency in the two MOAs? That's all I'm, I'm looking at. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the um, to look at that again. I have no problem supporting this. I mean, uh, when we were in in discussion, uh, and then it came back to us that they may not be in, uh, eligible because of the uh, minimal amount of hours or whatever it was. I'm just looking. Is there anything that would allow one to have it on our the other one no. not to have? So no, it's I don't think we don't control whether they can get unemployment. It really is a determination of the Department of Unemployment. So I, just I, respond. I, would I would recommend, and I'm not trying to stifle any more discussion, uh, just for the purpose of discussion, I would recommend approval with uh, bringing both MOAs into consistency. That's all. Similar language. Ms. Exton? Am I? So I'm looking at the traffic supervisors and maybe I'm not reading it accurately, but doesn't number six on that one say the same thing? Sorry. The school committee will notify them of their- Yes, right. yes. I, apolog I apologize, you're right. I didn't turn the page over. Okay. Yes. Thank you. They are consistent. Okay. Younger eyes prevail. All right, any more comment on this? So I'm looking for a motion. Mr. Schlickman. I move that we approve the MOAs and authorize the chair of the committee to sign it on our behalf. Second. All right, any more discussion? Seeing none. Um, Ms. Exton? Yes. Oh, see, now I have the wrong list for what we're doing on our interviews. <laughs> Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Mr. Spiegel, we don't need to approve them. Do we need to approve them separately? No. We can just do them both in one motion. Well, I, Mr. Schlickman, I guess, would be the question. If he made the motion, we're probably good, right? I think so. I see no reason why we can't approve both at once. Okay, great. All right, so the next item is the district 2019-2020 uh, goal progress um, from Dr. McNeil and curriculum leaders. Um, Dr. McNeil through, I actually I think he emailed us directly about um, questions from the committee about the presentation and the slides. So our curriculum leaders are here. So Dr. McNeil, I will let you introduce this. I, I know that I was derelict in my responsibility to provide my questions in advance. I, I could not make the timeline work uh, for some other things that I have going on. Um, but it, I would be, I, so I apologize for not, uh, not sending them in, but hopefully um, we can still we can still work through this. So, Dr. McNeil, would you like to uh, let us know where we're where we're at with this and and how we're wrapping this up? Yes, thank you very much. So, I have uh, all the curriculum leaders and directors who did not present at the last school committee meeting. At the last school committee meeting, we presented on the ELA and math goals and computer science uh, for the secondary. So, what I we have a number of slides. So the email that was sent was sent by uh, Karen, uh, Ms. Karen Fitzgerald to, to everyone to see 
if you had any questions and instead of you know, going through a, a full presentation, the curriculum leaders and directors are here to answer any questions you might have about the goals. I can, once again, I could give a, a short overview of how the goals have been structured in the slide deck and, and then we can go from there. Uh, so I will take the direction from you, Ms. Morgan. <clears throat> Um, so I, I guess I look to the rest of the committee. Do you would you like a short update of where um, of of those goals, or do people have questions that they're ready to ask? Why don't you give us a little um, a okay. little introduction, Dr. McNeil, just so sure. that we're all um, we've we've hit a lot of topics tonight. So <laughs> this is I'm <laughs> I'm re thank you. Mm -hmm. So, once again, uh, we are here to talk about the progress that we made on our 1920 curriculum and instruction district goals. So the goals that are in this slide deck pertain to goals 1.1, 1.2, and 2.1. 1.1 are the goals that we've written around student achievement, you know, um, and delivering the curriculum. And one point, there's 1.1 right there. Uh, so it's, you know, I won't read it to you, but again, it's like designing the curriculum to meet the needs of the students and doing it from the perspective of the, our vision of student as learner, uh, which is one of the documents, guiding documents that we utilize in order to identify specific skills that we're going to address in the curriculum and making sure that our lessons are aligned with those skills. And then uh, all of the, uh, I will just show it a sample. If you look at the, if you look at each one of the goals, you'll see that they're written in a certain format where you have the goal, you have the rationale for the goal, and then you have the action steps that were utilized in order to, um, in order to fulfill the goal. And then there's a progress uh, statement that is, was provided by each curriculum leader. So I have, and I put the goals in alphabetical order. We can start with digital literacy. Dr. Susan Bisson, the director of digital literacy is here. And we can start here if you want to just go through them one by one, read the goals. You've had, you know, I don't know how much you've had time to read the goals over the last couple of weeks, but it's, this is the same slide that, that we presented uh, during our last meeting. So we could go alphabetical order, go through 1.1, and then you know each one of the directors, curriculum leaders can answer questions uh, about the goals. Great. I don't think we need to read them because I, I have, I've read them, so I assume I think mm -hmm. others probably have too, um, and we're you know generally um, familiar with them. So um, should we do? Uh, I, I guess I look to the um, to the committee. It's now hard for me to see everybody. Um, I, I can stop sharing. Yeah, it's helpful to have both. This is when I really miss being in the room because then we could look at each other's faces and have that up on the screen, which would be great. Right. Um, <laughs> so, um, so should we? So we have tonight. We have um, digital literacy, and so questions from the committee um, on the district goals related to digital literacy. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So I, I want to commend the leadership, district leadership on the whole presentation and all the work on the goals uh, for the year. So I, uh, I just want to say that at the beginning. Uh, could the director of Di digital literacy just speak briefly? I, I'm, I'm really curious about the, um, <clears throat> the digital citizenship lessons and um, maybe talk a little bit about that and have, have we started to see an improvement in digital citizenship as a result of the lessons that took place um, last year? I guess it was most, well, I guess it was in the high school as well, but I mean, I don't know, are you, are, is there any way to measure an, an improvement in digital citizenship as a result of the work that we've done this year? I know there's been, there were more lessons, but is there any measure, is there any way to measure progress? Uh, currently, um, no, no real concrete way. We do have at the high school students completing 
uh, some sort of exit ticket. Uh, they are receiving digital citizenship curriculum through advisory. So the activities that they do um, with their teachers are uh, fairly targeted. We're using the common sense media curriculum, adapting that somewhat. Uh, it, so we do have responses from students about, um, about what the activity that they've done. In the elementary grades, our digital citizenship has really been um, focused at least last year uh, because as you may recall, digital citizenship began as a pilot um, in 2018. And then we were rolling it out. Uh, you know, we, our plans for each consecutive year sort of built on what we were doing. Now, um, so last year in grades four and five, students were receiving digital literacy, uh, sorry, digital citizenship curriculum and activities um, as part of a special, uh, along with keyboarding without tears. Um, middle school is slightly different that uh, children are, receiving some digital citizenship education, but it's not as formalized. Um, and we would have sort of continued that um, this year had it not been for the pandemic and, and needing to uh, switch our attention, uh, at least for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, others on digital literacy? Okay, great. Seeing none. Um, so the next one, Dr. McNeil. Yeah, I want to acknowledge the fact that the English uh, learner education, we do have a goal for that. Uh, however, the director of ELL was not able to make it tonight, so I can have her come back at, a, at another time in order to present on her goal. So we'll go on next to the history social studies, uh, which is for um, Mr. Denny, Conklin is here, the Director of History and Social Studies. Dr. McNeil, do you want to just refresh us for a minute and take us to that sure. slide, if you don't mind? Sure. Thank you so yep. much. I will do that right now. So I'll just give everybody a chance to read the goal real quick. Or uh, Mr. Conklin can just talk through, give an overview. So Mr. Conklin. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, the goal last year for history and social studies was for grades six through 11. It's actually year two of a two year goal around students' research skills and ability to write about their research. Um, so we were able to, and I believe it is in the next slide, uh, we were able as a department to determine the essential research skills and then um, put them, assign them to each grade so that we have a very specific focus in each grade six through 11 on the research skills that we want students to achieve mastery in. Um, so there's much more um, vertical and horizontal alignment in the way that we're completing research skills. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions people have. Great, thank you so much. Um, Questions for a quiet bunch tonight, Mr. Thielman. One quick question, uh, Mr. Conklin. I'm, I'm assuming that you're you're you didn't you didn't get a chance because of COVID. Quite understandable to finish the uh, research rubric and the common lessons plans on research. You're picking that work up now. Um, so we're not picking that work up now. I think that's going to be a task that we do towards the end of the spring semester and possibly over the summer. Um, we retooled our goals this year to be around using the online learning platforms. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we are going to be doing is looking at how we can infuse the research skills into students use of those online learning platforms. Um, but we had to put a pause on the rubrics and the lessons. Okay, thank you. Now I will echo uh, Mr. Conklin. It was something that we discussed as a department and um, we decided that, you know, because of all the online tools we've purchased this summer. And because we've had to do some 
uh, modifications of the curriculum in order to make sure we're focusing on those essential standards uh, due to the change in the format of instruction. Uh, that's been our focus for this year. So some of the goals have we've paused on them in order to focus on uh, providing a, you know, a robust and um, uh, challenging curriculum for our students for this year. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. Uh, do the students get an opportunity to, uh, to publish their research and share it with each other? Uh, that varies by teacher by teacher. Uh, I know at the high school level, one of the things that is important in our research projects at the high school level is having students uh, present their research in a different form. Um, they are required to pick an audience. They're required to pick a means of how they want to communicate their research to that specific audience. So for some students, that's been podcasts, some have done social media campaigns, some have uh, written letters to government officials at various levels. Um, I had a couple of students that made some websites, some students um, published some blogs or submitted some articles they wrote about their topics to some freelance uh, writing websites. So it's been varied ways that they've um, been sharing their work. Do we archive this and have it available for future students to use as a resource? Uh, we have exemplars that we've saved from year to year. Um, and that's really beneficial, not only just for us to have, but also to show students so that they have something to aim for. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? Great. All right. Next one, Dr. McNeil. Yeah, so the next one will be, like I said, we're going in alphabetical order. So we're going to move to our performing arts. And we have uh, Mr. William Papasisis uh, here to talk about that, if he could give an overview of the performing arts goal. Sure. So uh, the uh, the past couple of years, we've been uh, we've been implementing a new methodology. It's called conversational solfege, and there are two there are two pieces um, to this uh, program. The first is immersion, which happens in the in the in the primary grades K to one, K K through two, and then there's conversational solfege, which focuses on on literacy skills, and that's in the in the older grades four through four through five uh, three through five. And um, we found that K two, we found that that grade two is kind of a transition year between the immersion and then and then the focus on on music literacy skills, and so that's where we spent our time this year. And um, in addition to that, um, uh, we're also implementing a new um, a new arts curriculum framework, which came out this year. This was an implementation year, so we're looking at the. At the frameworks, and we were uh, looking at this transition year and um, determining what um, uh, what oral skills, uh, oral uh, and literacy skills would be working on, in addition to composition and improvisation, because that's sort of an, um, that's also one of uh, one of the goals and the and the uh, standards in the framework. Um, so we um, uh, we developed a, a curriculum outline. We identified essential standards. Content and we started working on some on some common assessments that we'd be, be using in second grade and that's pretty much where we left off before before the school closure. Um, we haven't continued this project this year because our focus has been on um, on developing our you know our remote learning curriculum um, and impl implementing uh, our online tools that we're using. Uh, so that's been our focus. This year, and to, uh, so that we can provide students with a robust music curriculum remotely. Great. Um, questions? I want to say one thing. I just please do. Yeah. yeah I, uh, Mr. Preposis, thanks so much. I, just, I do want to, <clears throat> we're talking about the goals, but I do want to commend uh, your team on onboarding some new talent uh, throughout the district at the elementary level and other places. So 
They're an amazing group of teachers. Yeah, Just an amazing group of teachers. Yeah. I witnessed it and they were talented because of uh, your leadership. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Exton. Um, I also just want to thank you and um, all of your team for the work. I know that um, teaching um, music remotely is incredibly challenging and the restrictions that have particularly been put on playing instruments and singing um, has really limited um, things. And I know that, you know, everyone in your department has worked really hard to make that work for students. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll convey the message to them. Okay, um, so we'll move, moving right along. Um, we're up to science and we have with us today, I will share my screen on science. We have the director of our K-12 science department, uh, Sam Hoyle is here along with our K-5 science coach, Ms. Sarah Huber. So uh, either Sam or Sarah, you can give an overview of the uh, science. Hey, good evening. It's uh, really nice to see you all. Um, this presentation will be very similar to the, the last one I made. I, I think the last time I spoke to you is right before our shutdown where I gave you a kind of where we're at peak. Um, but essentially we had three goals, one at each of our levels. Um, at the kindergarten level, we were really trying to incorporate more of the science practices. And in order to do that, um, a lab manual was created for tools of the mind. Um, and so teachers got that uh, last year and we started to implement more of the science lessons into the curriculums, um, into the tools of the mind curriculum. Um, and then in grades one through five, uh, it was decided that we would have a common assessment. So when I joined the, the team, I was given a common assessment. We put that out to teachers and the feedback was through the piloting um, that it was a little much. And so Sarah and I really kind of sat down together with teachers and really kind of tried to talk about what is the goal of the common assessment. And we decided that the goal was to measure our curriculum against the state standards. So we are hoping um, probably either late in the spring or over the summer to finish creating a, a new common assessment that will be solely um, guided by the standards and our curriculum and create a common rubric that the entire district would be graded on, and then hopefully have that attached to uh, report card or progress report report cards at the elementary level to give it a, a more robust um, standing there. Um, in grades six through eight, um, our goal was to start implementing uh, the new curriculum that was purchased for the district, which was iScience. Um, we're, we're working on that. It, it's a continuation in progress. Um, and this will be part of our goal moving forward, again, because it's an online platform, really trying to, to get students and teachers using that curriculum. And then finally, uh, grades 9 through 12, it was piloting um, project-based learning activities. Many of our courses were planning on kind of saving the project-based learning until the spring semester. And that's really where we kind of got cut off. So there were some um, teachers who were able to make this project um, happen. We had uh, um, the AP Bio team did a project about race and the biology of race. Uh, which is really good. I, I put it up as part of the examples for you to look at. Um, and there are a couple of oceanography and, and more of our elective courses had an opportunity to, to do and work with the PBLs versus our more core academic courses. Uh, but that is still something that we're, we're hoping to do more of um, 
over the next you know couple of years. Uh, so, any questions, Mr. Cardin? Thanks. So, on the um, the common assessments, it looked like they implemented one each grade, or how how many were actually out in the field and utilized last before we shut down? Um, that's a really hard question to answer. Um, every grade had done at least one. Some grades had done two. Um, I don't think any of them did three, um, but everybody had been given a, at least one. And, and what we found really was that these assessments were taking multiple days. Um, and that was, we felt it was too much for kids. Um, like I said, when I came in, we were handed the assessment and we were said, here you go, live long and prosper. And so we kind of, went with it and then we decided working with teachers that it wasn't gonna work that way. And we really needed to revamp it to make it more student friendly, um, but also to make it reflect the goal of, of what we thought the, the common assessment should be, which is, are we teaching the state standards? So we made it a lot more standards based. And okay. we also made it reflective in some ways of MCAS. So it's a series of multiple choice questions, but there's also open response questions. So it also gets students into the practice of um, getting ready for those, these high stakes tests that we have, we have to take. Right, so these, these revised assessments that you've now developed, those have not been used yet? No, we have, teachers have them at this point. Um, we decided to kind of hold off on them for this year and not make them mandatory. We have asked teachers if they would be willing to pilot them for us. Um, a couple of teachers have said yes. So we're really hoping that they'll actually do that. And then we can kind of sit down at the end of the year or over the summer to say, were they working? Did they not? And what common rubric can we create in order to then assess these equally across the district? Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else for science? Great. Back to you, Dr. McNeil. So next up we have visual arts and uh, Mr. David Ardito, who is our K-5 uh, art director and he can uh, go ahead now and speak and give you an overview. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. Uh, I think um, the main story for us is uh, teaching for artistic behavior, affectionately known as TAB. Um, I think some of you know that we received a significant um, Arlington Education Foundation Development and Expansion Grant to investigate TAB last year. And we made tremendous progress uh, before March. Unfortunately, uh, March kind of shut it down. Um, but teachers were involved in so many things uh, to learn about TAB, which is a uh, revolutionary, really, art educational uh, philosophy that is changing uh, the way teachers all across the country are delivering art instruction to students. Um, so we had teachers visiting teach, um, art teachers in other districts, uh, attending webinars on TAB, uh, doing TAB workshops with the national experts who actually visited us in person last year on a number of occasions. Um, anyway, that, that work unfortunately was shut down, we, but we did make tremendous progress. So our goal this year is to re-establish re that um, and continue that work. We've gotten an agreement with AEF and uh, these TAB experts uh, to continue that work. So we're excited about that. Um, I just want to say, why TAB? I know you're, you're thinking, you know, why TAB? Why is teaching for artistic behavior so important to us? It's because it aligns with our district's emphasis on social and emotional learning, because it empowers students as independent thinkers and art makers, 
and because it increases choice in materials and themes um, for students. Um, and they can make art about what concerns them and interests them the most. Social issues, their emotional challenges, the joys they feel, the joy they feel about things in their own lives and the sadness and so much more. So we're very committed to this. Um, we're gonna continue this work this year and uh, we're excited about it. Uh, questions? We have questions. I think we're all looking forward to coming back at some point to be able to um, see all of the artwork that gets shared by your team um, in our in our space um, at the high school and elsewhere. But it has been impressive. I've certainly seen a number of you know, there's, there's a lot of work to get their art out into the public and to share it, which I think is really important right now. Um, I, I want to also commend uh, Mr. Ardito because there have been lots of examples. Uh, I don't know if you remember that he presented last spring on a project that was done uh, for kids that were at home and we were, he presented the various uh, art pieces that were um, impact, you know, it, they, they, he presented the art pieces and it, it, what was created based upon the way that students were feeling about their current situation, the pandemic and being at home. And it was, it was all the way from kindergarten up to high school and it was just very dynamic. Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's evidence right there of the, the impact that this new way of, well, not new, but this inventive, you know, new, cutting edge way of, of addressing art instruction and the impact that it's had on our students. Let me just add that um, I am really proud of the job the art teachers are doing delivering art instruction now to both remotely and, and in the hybrid situation to art students. Um, they are, you know, doing a going above and beyond to to make sure kids are getting good solid art experiences, both at home and, and in school. Um, they're being, they've been using something, uh, thanks to Susan Bisson for this, uh, they've been using Padlet, which is a, an app that they can use to um, upload student work uh, and students can upload their own work to view and to comment on and they can share that. In fact, I'd love to share some of those Padlets with you. It's like a gallery of student art for every course for every grade level. And it's a great way to not only archive student work, but to uh, get students talking to each other about work. And they also put together, I don't know, hundreds of art kits so that students would have the materials that they need at home in order to participate in the remote art lessons that are being provided by our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Ardito, if you could, if you're able to share those padlets through um, Ms. Fitzgerald, that would be great. She would be the best person and she can get that out to the rest of us. I will sure. do that. Really nice to see. So thank you very much. Anybody else? All right, back to you, Dr. McNeil. Yes, next we have on health and wellness. So we have Ms. Bouvier, who is the director of our K-12 health and wellness uh, program. And she is here, Can uh, Cindy, you could just give an overview. Sure, hi everyone. Um, so last year, the wellness teachers met with kindergarten through third graders um, 10 times for each quarter. So um, they met with a quarter of the students, um, first term, second term, third term, fourth term. And um, what they did is they chose five of the units from the Great Body Shop, the health curriculum, and they decided to do two lessons on each of the units that they chose. And they were able to do that uh, first quarter, second quarter, and almost into third quarter, but then we were stopped because of COVID. Um, and so these are the lessons that they did, the safety, the symptoms of the body, nutrition, wellness, community health and safety, mental and emotional health and physical fitness. And um, it went great. It went great. The, um, as you know, physical fitness teachers, physical education teachers are really about keeping kids physically active, but um, they did really buy into this um, 
you know, teaching health, keeping them seated in the classroom as, as much as they could um, during this time. And the students, the feedback that they got from students, they loved it. The students loved it. They loved learning about themselves. So they were physically active in physical education classes. This was in addition to. Um, unfortunately, that is not happening this year. Hopefully it will happen again next year. And I will say that those lessons, if I'm correct, Ms. Bouvier, were made possible because of the way that we had the newly structured uh, elementary schedule where we had the ACE block times. That is uh, absolutely our, correct. Right. We had 10 additional classes um, for, per physical education class. So if you had um, physical education 10 times, you know, twice a week, you had 10 extra lessons per year. And that's how they got those. And, um, and thanks to you, we have the staffing for this and the schedule fit right into it. Um, unfortunately, the schedule this year is not quite the same, but hopefully next year it will be. So I just wanted to add that as one of the other, and our, our primary goal was to give uh, teachers and building administrators an opportunity to look at data on a weekly basis and group by grade level teams but this was one of those um, ancillary benefits from that schedule and how right. it impacted the uh, curriculum, the wellness curriculum, the health and wellness curriculum. It really did. And the students loved it and the staff loved it. So hopefully we'll get back to that. Great questions. I've lost Mr. Sh oh, there he is. I lost you for a minute, Mr. Shipman. You just moved to my left. Um, great. Thank you so much. Um, McNeil? Yes. So next up, we have World Language, and we have Don Carney uh, here. And World Language, you see it's for grades 6 through 12, because that's where we offer World Language. And uh, Ms. Carney, can you give an overview? Absolutely. Thank you very much for having us tonight. Um, we started, very fortunately, the department received a generous AEF grant to help us with our curriculum revisions. Um, and we had um, two days last year with a national consultant um, to help us develop thematic units across grades 6 through 12. And concurrent with our work in developing the thematic units, we were working on immediately putting into practice um, effective instructional strategies. So our overarching goal last year for the whole department was to increase the student use of target language during instruction. Um, teachers have been working for years um, before my arrival here in Arlington. So before three years ago, they had already been working to in, um, increase their percentage of target language use to 90% or more. And um, we're following the national standards to do that also for students. So that was our overarching goal for last year for everybody, all great, all languages, all grade levels, with the slight exception of Latin, because um, there's not as much spoken language in Latin. Um, we had uh, teachers had four PLC meetings before um, we left, uh, before the coronavirus um, interrupted school in March. Uh, that's where the the bulk of teacher work happened because it gave them an opportunity to discuss by grade level and within and among languages at the high school. Um, particularly teachers don't work only by language at the high school. They don't group themselves that way for their PLC time. Um, that's where teachers really have the time to discuss the strategies that they've applied, how they've been effective, when they haven't been effective, what have they done. Um, this is absolutely the work that we're, that, that this is the essential work of world languages is having whatever the target language is be the language of communication for everything that is happening 90% of the time or more. Um, clearly this does not happen in grade six where students meet um, only every other day for half of the school year. Um, but as soon as we start in grade seven, um, where students have language every day, there's a very intentional um, scaffolding process to bring students there. And by the end of seventh grade, we, we can get students um, close to that. It is much more challenging to do this remotely 
Um, when we left school last year, um, physical school, and switched to online learning, um, we made a, um, again, a very intentional effort to stay connected with students, to create space where they felt comfortable and safe to participate as much as possible. And because we know that we refer to it as the effective filter in world languages, that when students are not comfortable, they will not take the risk to speak the language that is new to them. Um, there's so much that goes, as you have all experienced, I'm sure, professionally, but also in this meeting, there is so much um, communication that happens without words, body language, reading the room, learning and gleaning from each other. Um, so that has been our, our biggest um, challenge is to have to hold students accountable to create that same accountability for using the target language. However, it doesn't mean it's not happening. There was, um, I just actually sent emails today to all three building principals to just share the positives um, that I have seen in all of the world language classes that I've, you know, I was able to observe, observe all of the teachers. And um, there's a lot of work going well there, but that is that is certainly where we are most significantly impacted by um, closure, remote learning. Questions? Uh, Dr. Al Snampy. I appreciate you're giving the background on this. I'm wondering when you think you will be able to get the new thematic units finished up and, and running. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a great question and we, it's, it's a harder question to answer um, simply. The simple version is, is that we will have um, level one units running next year. We have five different languages at the high school, one of which is Latin, so those are not happening um, at the same, the same, it, it's because it's not a modern language, it, it's a completely different approach. Um, but we just don't have the same number of teachers that are available to work on these projects um, outside of Spanish, where we have the most, um, the, the highest percentage of enrollment, we have the highest number of teachers. So our work is just a little bit slower because we do have to have, while we're able to work as um, a whole team across languages to have a language agnostic curriculum, meaning that everybody in level one will be learning the same themes. Um, we do need to have the language specific teachers to cultivate the resources um, and then develop the language specific activities that we need. But we will have, we have draft, um, we have draft assessments for four units. So we will almost, um, almost surely be rolling out, if not all of new curriculum in level one next year, at least three quarters of it. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? All right, go ahead, Dr. McNeil. So before I move on to go uh, objective 1.2, um, I just wanted to point out that if, if, you've able to, if you were able to see that there's a theme for the, the goals for, that, we, uh, that we created for 1920, and it was focusing on tier one instruction. So whether or not it's looking at assessments, uh, looking at the format of instruction, or looking how to align curriculum with the new standards and look at the various skills that students need to, to work on. That was a common theme for our goals for 1920. Common theme for our goals for 2021 is student engagement and being able to adjust the curriculum to fit uh, a hybrid or remote uh, learning environment. So I just wanna point that out that we have various themes that are going on here and that may um, not, they, necessarily may not align together perfectly from last year to this year. Um, and then, so we're gonna go on to goal objective 1.2, which focuses on you know, integrating SEL and cultural literacy into our instruction. And we have uh, Ms. Sarah Bird, who is our director of K-12 school counseling and social emotional learning here to talk about that goal. And I will share my screen. Sure, don't wanna leave out that preschool though. Pre-K-12. Oh, pre-K to 12, right. That is that correct. Not me, folks. So yeah. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you. Um, so similar to um, last year, everybody else here, we uh, 
we were rolling and then March, we sort of did a little inverse, but you'll notice something kind of interesting about what we did in March. So um, we spent our time last year getting our boots on the ground and doing a really intense audit. Um, in Arlington, we have a lot of raw materials in the uh, in the classrooms and in the hands of all of our expert educators. And I wanted to really find out what it was. So we used some walkthrough tools from CASEL and that's the Collaborative for Academic and Social Emotional Learning, specifically looking at how are our schools and our classrooms actually manifesting these safe and supportive learning environments. So we use this walkthrough tool in all of our buildings and um, you'll see in the linked report there that we were able to walk through all of our buildings in the elementary schools, except for um, we got partially through Dallin and then we didn't get to Pierce. So we were able to get through, um, if you want to, Rod, you, you can totally click on that link if you want to, it's totally up to you. But it gives you some of the, the visuals, gives you a chance to um, take a look at what we were able to see in those spaces. Um, yeah. I don't know if I can, hold on, let me see, make sure I can see. Yeah. Okay. It's also just a nice visual change of pace for folks. I know you've been looking at the same blue screen for a while. So we said we were gonna map it and we did map the entire preschool as well. So we were able to map all of the preschool classrooms um, in Hardy, as well as the ones at the high school. And you can keep scrolling down to Rod if you want to. Um, nice little bar graph for folks to get a chance to take a look at it. We, um, there we go. So we were all the way up to about 60 classrooms and you'll notice that um, D was for Dallin and then Pierce we were gonna get to in May. And so we paused right about there. So we did a really nice job getting through mostly all of our schools and we have um, individual item analysis on all of the classrooms in particular, as well as the grade levels. And we were able to map the preschool, the K, the first and the second grade. What we did with all of that data then is we sat down with principals and classroom teachers using their ACE block time or their leadership team time. And we shared the data. We also used our early um, release time at the elementary level and shared images that we were able to snap through um, just taking pictures across the district to show classroom teachers what these positive climate artifacts look like district-wide. And so it was really great, kind of a way to take learning walks virtually uh, across the district using these walkthrough tools as an opportunity. And uh, principals were, were able to bring some of these data points and cross-reference them with the vocal climate data, built it into their school improvement plans. Um, and then some others were able to take them and use them in their team student achievement goals and cross-reference them with moments where we saw student voice was perhaps a little low. And so we were able to take the student voice measures from the walkthrough tools, the student voice measures from the vocal climate survey, and then use that to inform an educator student achievement goal. So thanks, Rod. That's great for the um, slide there. So come March, um, we had all these great things in place and we were rolling and um, and we paused, I mean, you can see all the wonderful PD that we also had when you take a look at this. Um, and we have a, a lot of opportunities for staff to do learning, but there really wasn't uh, and still isn't a cohesive tier one universal SEL curriculum in place. We have responsive classroom as a, a climate setting morning meeting routine in place, um, but this was a really good opportunity for us to audit it and see how it was taking hold in the climate of all of our buildings. So once we took a look at that um, and then we closed schools, the grids actually gave us a really interesting moment to start to consistently offer every single classroom and every single teacher the opportunity to have access to the same resources, at least digitally and virtually. And so we started to push out the same content through the grids district-wide. Um, so it was a lot of work and it was kind of an odd silver lining moment, but that's what happened post closure. So you may or may not recall, there was a um, how to start your day section of the grid and then an SEL section of your grid 
which we had never really had before. And the How to Start Your Day had a lot of great opportunities to embed within morning meeting, um, in addition to your morning meeting structure, the morning messages and so on. And then SEL curriculum that was pulled from a number of evidence-based curricula that's either been in place in a couple of our buildings, um, but was being provided for free because of COVID. And so it was a really interesting opportunity um, to pilot that across the board and see what teachers liked, what they didn't like, and get their feedback from it um, and move from there. So it was an unofficial kind of um, opportune pilot. And that's what we were able to do last year. Questions? Mr. Carden. Thank you. Um, and I'm not sure when we last had our SEL presentation, but um, we maybe do for a, a separate one um, coming up in the next few months. Uh, so when when you say the the curriculum was was mapped, what is what does that look like? Is it like standards where you know what we do in the first month was mapped to a certain standard, or or what what does that actually physically look like? Yeah. So we were mapping the the existence of a curriculum used to fidelity? Is there a specific time scheduled in the week, the day, the month? How much time? Is it evidence-based? Who delivers it? Is it aligned with state standards? And then taking a look at across the grade level, is there 100% fidelity across the grade level with the same adherence to that schedule, curriculum, and so on? Um, is it consistent building-wide? Is it consistent district-wide? And you will find themes in Arlington where you will have either a grade level that's completely in sync or a building that has themes, but we do not have complete adherence grade-wide, building-wide, or district-wide to a single evidence-based curriculum across the board. Um, and our responsive classroom trends are very strong, but they are not 100% to fidelity. That was one thing that we saw that we wanted to improve upon. And that's part of what informed our PD time as well this fall. And it's why we spent a lot of time dedicated to the social emotional um, training for the skills for all of our staff and also spending a lot of time going through what does morning meeting look like? How do we make sure staff who've maybe never been formally trained in morning meeting have a baseline training in what morning meeting looks like, especially if it's done virtually or remotely? So we're always, um, it, it does require an ongoing investment financially as well. And so how do we find a way to continue that, to invest in that? Um, and especially when we have this fractured uh, staffing structure, uh, how do we make sure that even the, the students who are with staff on their at home days have staff that are familiar with and comfortable and understand the core tenets of responsive classroom. So we've been working to try to keep up with our continual change in the structure. So to be, to be honest, um, we haven't even gone much further in depth to do a curriculum audit. This is just the very basic landscape analysis of what is in place, what's actually reaching kids, and let's start there. Great. Yeah, I, I do think it might be worth you know getting a little bit more granular about what you found mm -hmm. um, with us at some point in time, um, and because that will inform going forward where we need resources and you know how we how we can implement what you're what you're envisioning. So. Um, maybe some more information at some point. And the the, um, the district. Share, we were able Oops. to some really things. Go ahead. You go. Sorry, was somebody else speaking? Nope. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yes. The district capacity assessment, um, is that like a, was that like a written document or was that um, more of an exercise that you went through? The district capacity assessment is an online um, fidelity tool that comes out of the national um, IRN, now I have to remember NERN. So um, implementation, implementation science research network. So it takes a look at what is the district's actual capacity 
to implement this kind of work. And what we found from our numbers in our first year of doing the assessment is that we have work to do system wide in order for our schools and our teachers to actually be able to implement the work and that we can purchase all we want, but there are some other drivers of change and implementation science that we also need to improve on in order to expect any change in the SEL implementation to shift. We did not get a chance to do it because we need to have an outside facilitator do it. We need to have our leadership team together. And understandably, our leadership team was managing COVID. Mm -hmm. So um, we are hopefully going to have an opportunity in the future, but we haven't had a chance to do it yet. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Great. Dr. McNeil? Yeah, so that, that I don't know if you want me to keep going because we, we can get into the professional development, uh, which is goal 2.0. Um, we definitely can keep speaking about the professional development that was provided for staff. Uh, and a lot of it is connected to the goals 1.1 uh, in order to make sure that we were addressing the tier one goals and for instruction, we needed to make sure that we had a very um, organized and aligned professional development plan uh, that, you know, supported what we were trying to do within the classroom. Uh, one of those goals is, you know, also we focused on cultural literacy. And I, I presented last year on the November 3rd day and the fact that we had uh, identified eight hours that all staff would participate in eight hours of cultural literacy training. And uh, we were able to address that goal. Um, so I, I don't know if you want me to go further or. I think know. we should see if there are questions from the Yeah, I can take, yeah, I can take questions. Well, but yep. I know that you've always done a good job, Dr. McNeil, of keeping us um, up to date about what opportunities have been provided to teachers and what's been run through the district and what, um, and we did, you know, we, we did do, and I guess this is really going to be part of the 2020, 2021 PD, but we've, we talked a lot about the PD that was done over the summer, um, as well, which I think was really helpful. So, mm -hmm. um, questions on that for Dr. McNeil or anybody else? Okay, all right, great. All right, great. so that, that concludes our presentation. Again, uh, the rest of the information is in the slide deck. So if you have questions you know, after this meeting, feel free to send me those questions and I will provide the responses. So I would like to just thank um, all of our uh, you know, curriculum leaders and directors and, the, and coaches uh, who, this is a group effort. This is a very collaborative, effort. Um, we do a lot of this. We have a lot of discussions about, you know, alignment um, standards and how we build the curriculum. And also we talk about the assessments that will provide us the information to let us know how we're progressing and how students are um, receiving uh, the lessons that we've designed. So it, it's a very talented group of individuals who are very knowledgeable and uh, you can see at the end of the slide, the, the whole department. So this is a, a group effort. And I just want to applaud everybody in our, uh, on our team that does such a great job with um, you know, the work that they do. And also it, we, we couldn't do any of this work without the classroom teachers. So it, it really is a, a group effort uh, from the, all the way from administrators, all the way to our very talented uh, teachers and support staff and TAs and paraprofessionals. This is a this is a, a, a this is a group effort. So I just want to make sure that I uh, acknowledge that. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Thank you for putting this together for us and um, for guiding us through it over a couple of evenings. Um, so, okay, all right. Um, the next item on the agenda is the FY22 uh, budget calendar first read. Um, so I believe that that is in Novus. 
Dr. Allison Ambi, did you want to speak to that? Just that um, it's a calendar like you've seen every year where we're putting up the schedule of when we're going to be talking about um, the budget and the requests from principals. Uh, we'll be hearing them in December. Um, dates have been updated for this year. Uh, we've heard from FinCom that they're running on their normal schedule because I felt that that was a po potential question, but apparently they're running as normal. So everything works out pretty much okay. Um, we can have, there was some question whether we needed to have this approved this week. Um, there is no reason, this is just a schedule. So, you know, it, it can be in draft, it's, it works just as well. And then we'll just formally approve it um, at our next meeting whenever, um, but it gives you an outline of when things will be happening. That's all. Great questions or comments for Dr. Allison Ampey. Okay, uh, superintendent's report, Dr. Bodhi. Thank you. Uh, there are two items um, that are actually highlighted in the agenda, but before um, we go to those, I want to touch on a couple of other things. Um, one of our speakers this evening spoke about Governor Baker's uh, request that, uh, that school districts go full in person. Uh, one of the things that is the foundation of why we are in Arlington in either a hybrid program or the remote is that uh, we decided as a community at, that we wanted to have deaths six feet apart. I, I had that discussion again this week with our uh, Department of Health and Human Services and the representatives on the Board of Health and they concur that this is their position as well. Uh, we have been very successful up to this, uh, to, the, to today, that we've had zero transmissions within our schools. And as a testament to how well our staff, our students are abiding by all of our protocols. And we know that that's the case because of contact tracing. So at this juncture, my, my strong recommendation uh, is that we maintain the six foot distancing of deaths, which means that there's a limitation to the number of students uh, that can um, be in our schools at any one time. Uh, this may be something the committee would like to take up and discuss it at a greater length at some time, but I did want to, since we're meeting tonight, acknowledge uh, the governor's uh, proclamation last week and the, um, what is underlying uh, the, the reason why we have the programming that we have. The second thing is testing. Uh, we continue to offer testing, free testing to our staff. And I, I gave you a, a summary of our testing up to date, by, but uh, I want to also let you know that the results of this week's was that we tested 255 teachers, staff, and staff, and we had we had um, no positives; all were negative, which was terrific. Next week, we are moving the testing from Monday to Friday um, because the following Monday. Uh, our teaching staff, for the most part, will be remote. Actually, pretty much everyone will be remote. And so we're moving into Friday um, on 11.20. And all that information will be um, communicated to staff. So I, I have one other thing to talk about, but let's go into the reports. You had asked for a report in hiring, and Mr. Spiegel uh, is prepared to do that. Thank you. So. Since our last school committee meeting, um, we've onboarded eight new paraprofessionals at, at different schools, teaching assistants, instructional support personnel, um, and including in the remote academy, and two uh, new uh, P 
people uh, sort of in one additional position, um, sort of a special education reading teacher position uh, at Stratton. And then we are actually, we have a resignation that we're replacing um, school counselor um, at uh, someone who was just hired this year is, is already leaving. So we're replacing that person with a, a, new, a new person um, in a couple weeks. So 10 new staff, we're still, again, um, we have postings up for uh, building subs and paraprofessionals. I know there's been a lot of um, interest in hiring more people to support our buildings and our um, teachers in the hybrid program and the remote program. So um, we're still actively searching. It's, it's been challenging still, but we are continuing to post and try to, to find, um, so find some different positions and see how, if we can continue adding people. Um, and that's where we are. Great, Dr. Bodhi, can we take questions? I see one from Mr. Hainer. Can we take questions on what you've presented so far and then go into the second bit? Is that all right? Absolutely. Great, Mr. Hainer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spiegel, are we anywhere near going back to the 2.30 uh, regular part on the hybrid, or are we still having uh, the program end at 1.30 at the elementary level? Um, my understanding is it's still, it's, um, sorry, 1.45. Um, yeah, I think that's still, I mean, there's a lot of, I think it's more than, I mean, obviously we do need to add some more staff still for, at some schools are still short a few teaching assistants or building subs to be able to support that. Um, I, there may be other considerations as well that would need to take place before we could go to 2.30. So um, we're not quite there yet at every school. Thank you. Um, so my question parallels uh, Mr. Hainer's. I think it would be helpful. I, I receive more than one email a week, a couple emails a week about 2.30. Um, I think it would be helpful for the committee to understand uh, what what the, where we're trying to get to. Um, I know when the principals were here, um, gosh, five or six weeks ago, they had said that they were gonna meet the subsequent week and sort of figure out where they were at and what their sort of, you know, where their tipping point was. So I, I hope that there's, there's something, um, but I, I, think, I think it's time to let the community know clearly um, what, where that tipping point is and and how we're making progress towards achieving it. So um, I, I assume that it's not uh, sort of a moving target. Um, is that something that, I mean, I, I don't know, Mr. Spiegel, is it if it's from you or if it's from Dr. Bodie to the elementary principals, but you know, I, I think it's I think it's time to know what percent progress are we making towards keeping kids in school until 2.30? We're making progress. Um, you asked what the metric is. Ideally, what we would like, and we've been saying this for actually some time, is a, at minimum, one paraprofessional teaching assistant per grade. Now, this is in addition to um, the teaching assistants we have in the kindergartens. Uh, in addition to our special education teaching assistants, and in addition to the building sub. So we are not there at every school. In fact, um, I think maybe we only are at that at one school at this time. So we continue to remain um, active in trying to seek more people. And so I say this publicly, if you know anyone who is interested in being a teaching assistant, we would be very interested in speaking with you. Right. I think it method. would just be helpful to understand, do you need, so if you're there maybe at one school, so you need at least six, because there's seven schools, is it six, is it 12, is it 16, is it 60? I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't know. So I think it would be, you know, I don't know how, like, if, if, um, if we're not going to go to 230 until we have all of those people, which if that's the decision, um, that's the decision. It just would be helpful to know how close we are to that. Um, I can't tell you right now exactly how close we are to that. Um, 
but that's what we would need. The reason why we're at 145 is that we cannot provide uh, our teaching staff both with lunch and with a prep period, which is contractual ob obligation with the support staff that we currently have. That's the issue. Um, so we are able right now to be able to do lunch, but not a, a prep period. And in the past, um, how this worked when we, we were pre-COVID is that we would have our specials uh, intermingled through the day and uh, a teacher would have lunch and their prep at a time when either students were at lunch or they were having a special. That's how it works in elementary schools. And when you take that out of the, uh, the ability to have specials out uh, then that, that therein lies what the challenge is. So we need to have someone that can be in classrooms when it, when a teacher is going to have a prep period. Right, and I understand that. I absolutely want teachers to have their prep period. Um, I understand that's our obligation, but it's also the right thing to do very right. much. No, oh. I'm not. I'm not questioning that. I'm just. I'm not looking to end run around it. I just want to know how many people. We still need, right. do we need fewer people than we needed on September 15th? Are we halfway there? Are we a quarter of the way there? Are we ever gonna get there? Are we just gonna tell people we're never gonna get there and we're never gonna do 2.30? It, it would just, you know, it's, it's. Um, I'm, I'm ready for more um, data, I guess. Yeah, so. um, I can get you that information for the next time we meet. But I will tell you that everybody would like to be able to go to that to 2.30. That is, that is a goal. In fact, it was just discussed this week among the elementary principals and they all would like to get there. That, so, and they're very active in trying to hire people. It's just, it's a challenge. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Uh, you know, I'm gonna go, uh, thank you, Ms. Morgan. I'm gonna go back to the initial, uh, the comment Dr. Bodie made about um, the six foot rule. Mm -hmm. um, Part of the problem, <clears throat> right, Governor Baker uh, issued his statement. Part of the problem is that on the uh, DESE website that, and in the DESE guidance, it's vague or it's, it's, it's contradictory when it comes to the three foot versus six foot rule. The language is something to the effect of it is advisable to have six feet, but you can have three feet. And so that causes the problem at the local level because local authorities are going to look at that guidance and use it. And it's probably best to be conservative. I probably would be conservative if I were in the shoes of our public health department. My question for you is <clears throat> in the meetings with the superintendents, is there ever any conversations or requests to DESE to be more specific on that rule? I mean, there is research out there that can be examined by the state of Massachusetts. It's not something we can, I think for those of us to opine on that, uh, that data at the local level is, is almost, um, is probably not helpful because we're not experts. We're just reading, you know, news reports and summaries of studies, which I, which a lot of us have read. I've read, but I mean, I guess, I guess, is there any in the superintendent's meeting? Is there any request for more uh, specific guidance on the distance between desks from DESE, which would help the conversation at the local level? Well, DESE, uh, I don't know if they've really changed their position and saying this summer they would be, it'd be acceptable to have three feet. Yeah. Uh, the CDC still recommends six feet. Yeah. And I, I was in a, a call this morning with um, a number of superintendents in this area and they also are, are abiding by the six feet distance. The thing is we've had a lot of success in having zero transmission and, you know, do we want, what, what, are, what are a test to the success? Is it because we uh, definitely have hand washing as a, um, a practice every, in the schools? Is it we're wearing masks? Is it six foot distancing? Is it the limited contact we have? Uh, you know, it's a package. And the question is, do you take one thing out and will that change? And we don't know, it could, it, it, it might not either. Um, so I guess that's a question that we have to wrestle with. And of course, right now in, at a time when we have uh, increasing COVID 
in the state, there's a, there's a, there's a reluctance to take that chance. Yeah, I, 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 I totally, I totally get that. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with it at all. I'm just saying, is there any, um, uh, are, are the superintendents asking for more definitive guidance based on science? Because there is science out there that um, suggests that wearing a mask, keeping adults six feet away from students and allowing students to be closer together um, still is sufficient to mitigate risk. There's science out there, but it's not for us at the local level to make that judgment. It's really for people at the CDC, at the state level. And I'm wondering if the superintendents are asking Essie for better guidance, more concrete guidance based on science, that's all. Um, we have not put a formal proposal into DESE. Okay, thank you. Nor have we heard anything from DESE along the lines of what you just said. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hainer, and then Dr. Allison Ampey. First off, I, I wanna commend you and the rest of this town for keeping us safe. Uh, I'd rather err on the side of caution than take any risks. That being said, we had a couple of parents in the open forum at the beginning talking about seniors, is there, are you looking, or, and Dr. Jenga, looking at all to provide some opportunities for the seniors for the spring? Um, I, don't the know what, I don't know what the plans are for senior activities, but what I can tell you is that, uh, it, it, I don't wanna get ahead of what Dr. Jenga is going to present to all of you, uh, but but he is going to present a hybrid options. And that's okay. why he's had these focus groups to okay. present various options to people just to see where people are on them. Um, you, you know, the uh, the high school, even though we, and, and by the way, I wanna commend uh, the facilities department and, and Jim Feeney, the, the high school um, has been able to rectify a lot of the ventilation and knock on wood, it lasts, because that is been an issue that they fix it, then it breaks again. Um, and we have a number of, of you know, bigger areas where we can have bigger classes be in the same room. But then again, the problem is we have six feet distance uh, and you have say a science class of uh, 22, 24 kids, but the class of moment holds 12, you know, what do you do? Um, can you have two kids separated into contiguous science rooms with one teacher? So they're exploring these issues. Mm -hmm. um, and the high school is not exempt from the, the restrictions we have everywhere else. And the classrooms are only so big. Uh, but I, I think he's doing a nice job on looking at the options and you'll hit, see his report very soon. I think it's important for the parents to know that we're not just making arbitrary decisions, you're making an effort to go forward. And the primary concern, and I applaud you and the entire staff, uh, is the health and uh, welfare of our students and our faculty. So thank you again. Well, thank you, because that is, that is really our number one. Isn't that the most important thing we do is to keep our, our, our staff and our students safe? I mean, that is, not that education is not important for sure, but that is even more important. Uh, Dr. Al Scampi, and then Mr. Cardin. Okay, I was just gonna point out that when you reduce the, if you go from say six feet to three feet, it's not just that you're putting the students close to each other, you're also putting however many more kids into the box that, of air that mm -hmm. um, is in there and therefore increasing whatever po potential viral passage there is. Now, hopefully the ventilation is taking care of that and stuff, but I, I agree that it would be really nice if we were getting better science and better interpretation of the science and better guidance based on the interpretation of the science from above. Um, I hope, Someday that will happen. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cardin. Thanks. Yeah, I two points. One is that um, the you know the the very limited, unfortunately very limited, but the very limited data everywhere is that transmission in schools, not just in Arlington, but everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, is quite low. Um, mm -hmm. So so that's good news if that continues and is verified. Um, 
But I also think we need to look at, you know, what happens when the vaccine, which we got favorable news on this week, it becomes available, you know, possibly for teachers as early as February or March. So if we have teachers vaccinated by the end of February, what are we going to do? Are we going to change anything? We need to start having those discussions, um, you know, in the new year uh, about if, if, the, if the favorable news continues about any changes we might be able to accommodate once our teachers are vaccinated. So I just wanted to put that out there while we were discussing it. Thank you. Um, my understanding is that teachers probably are in the third tier. Um, that would correct. be a very- That's, huh? that's not correct, Dr. Bodhi. Oh, well, that's what the, our, our Department of Health and Human Services has said, that's most likely in the third. I mean, if we could get it by February, it'd be fabulous. I don't, I don't know. I, I just don't know where we're gonna be and when it's going to be available to the public. I asked that very question. When, when will teachers get the, be able to have this shot? And um, I think people are just speculating right now, but um, if we could have it this spring, that could be significantly um, a change. Though we also have to be very careful that we don't create a situation where, where there's any transmission of, of student to student either. In fact, we have a, a um, an, another incident of a, of a COVID case um, in our district today at at, one, at, a, at Pierce Elementary. So, I mean, this is the kind of thing that we're going to be seeing, you know, increasingly so that has implications for classrooms for for staffing. Um, but and I don't see that changing for some time. All right, any more questions on this or comments? Um, then uh, also wanted to hear about enrollment and um, Michael Mason is going to give uh, that report. Good evening. Um, earlier, uh, I sent all members uh, the current enrollment report and projection with a memo. Uh, this report uh, was also shared with the the budget subcommittee uh, earlier this week in a meeting. Um, as you may know, uh, the enrollment is a, is a variable that is used to calculate how um, education is funded across the Commonwealth through the chapter 70 funding formula. So, um, and locally, um, we have that agreed uh, funding formula with the long range planning committee, the school committee, as well as with town uh, administration to fund Arlington Public Schools. Um, so the current enrollment numbers that are in the report are not yet certified, but they're probably not likely to change as much at this point. And, um, but DESE's in that process of certifying once their reconciliation process is complete. Um, um, the enrollment numbers are pulled from two different reports, which is the district enrollment by grade and special education enrollment for out-of-district placement. Um, last year's enrollment for October, the October one enrollment numbers was a little bit over 6,000. It was 6,128 uh, students. And compared to where we're at this year at 5,849 students of enrollment, um, we're down 279 students. Um, and part of our normal projection, um, or uh, when we, we get, provide our enrollment figures, we do a, a five-year projection as well. And included last year was a projection that we would have been at a higher number. Uh, and we're actually down 429 students from that uh, enrollment. With most of the, the, vari the variances from the projection between uh, grades, uh, preschool to, to third grade. Um, so um, we also looking at it, the, we, the overall between, we had about over 900 students leave the district, but of the 900, 342 of those, um, it was 966 students to be exact, 342 of those were the graduates of the senior class last year. So really that we wanna look at the 624 students and to figure out 
which students are going to actually going to come back to the district. Um, and so, you know, um, in the report uh, explains that currently, and we use the power school system to track all of our student data and it explains uh, currently we have about 140 students that uh, transferred out of the, the district to a private school. So there's possibly a portion of those students that might return um, and that will try to figure that out and that percentage of students that may return will be important to determine how we may fund uh, education in the district going forward. Um, also, 245 of the students in the report moved out of Arlington to either whether to a different town, different state, or even out of the country. Um, and about 80 of the students uh, are, are currently have been approved to be homeschooled. Um, and in that data, since the data is not, it's, it's not centralized, is entered by each school, we're still investigating about 127 students that left the district that we're not 100% sure about. But looking at all these figures, we're gonna to have to figure out that percentage of students that we believe that's gonna come back um, to because we're gonna still have to serve all those students at some point. Um, well, we're, we're also um, gonna start, we have to look at the birth rates of the younger students to see how many students that you know, and we have a low kindergarten enrollment. So we, we need to make sure to see if there are students that didn't enroll this year, or the families that didn't enroll their students this year, you know, are they gonna come to Arlington Public Schools next year um, or at some point in the future uh, when they feel comfortable sending their children back to, to the district. Um, it, it, but all of this, Analysis is going to be complicated because there's a lot of variables. You know whether families have sent students to uh, private schools and if they're intending to return those kids back, or whether um, you know even look at the birth rates, whether some of those families have already migrated out of Arlington or not. Um, but uh, our next steps is to, to to finalize and figure out a you know what what that percentage of uh, of students and will be returning and to try to provide this information obviously to this committee, to long range planning and as well as to town management to work on uh, of an agreement on how to, to move forward and make sure that we can be able to fund the district maybe hopefully with a, a way if it's, if it's um, uh, level funded or, or whatnot, like a hold harmless mechanism, not level funded, I meant to say hold harmless, in the sense that, you know, the students that we lost this year, we should not consider as part of that calculus going forward. I think uh, that's, that's, I don't have anything else to say beyond that, but the report explains more. If you have any questions, I'll feel free to ask now. Mr. Hainer. My concern is we lose this amount of students. It has an effect on our state reimbursement. Even if these people come back, we lose it for a full year because we're not going to get credit bottom until the following October. Do we know this is a unique year? There's no question about it. This sounds like it's something that may be happening in other districts as well. Is there any thought of communicating this with the state? When you talk about holding us harmless, the, the town can't hold, I, I can't see the town making up for what the state usually gives us. But does, I mean, it's going to be a rough year no matter what. So, I mean, is there any thought of other communities dealing with a similar problem and going to the state and say, hey, uh, at least give us the money we had last year? Um, if I might jump in here, the answer is yes. Um, the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents did a statewide survey. And this is exactly what's happening in other districts to, you know, to a more or less degree. Uh, we're also going to be contacting state legislators uh, with a proposal to hold harmless for, for the year. Um, I mean, and for Arlington, that, that still have some, some kind of negative effect in that we've been increasing enrollment each, each year. And so that would not be taken into account. But yes, now that hasn't happened yet, but it's being presented. Thank you. 
Mr. Schlickman. Thank you. I mean, that's an important point in that our chapter 78 has been increasing because the enrollment increases have driven our minimum net school spending above the caps of the required local contribution so that we're, we've been getting a bump in aid. And if we don't have the bump in enrollment, we're gonna get hit particularly hard uh, for, for next year's uh, chapter 70 money. Uh, my question really is that if we have students that we would have normally expected to join us this year for kindergarten, who were held back by families who decided, uh, you know, they'd like to wait a year and have a more normal kindergarten experience for their child. Do we have any way to counterestimate that number? Um, go ahead, Mike. Well, um, in the sense of the, the only estimate would be based on trying to find the birth rate data. Yeah. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, won't give us an accurate count. Um, we only, the students that were enrolled there, if you look at the report, there's about 18 students that did, that was enrolled this year. That mm -hmm. was, they were all kindergarten uh, grade level that was then removed. And it's, it's pretty clear in the data that those families do intend to send those students back next year. But for the students that may have not enrolled in the, uh, uh, and, or, and are not reflected in our system, the only information that we can really use is, uh, is understanding the, the, the birth rate data that's, um, and that will give us an idea of how many students would have possibly been part of this incoming kindergarten class. And then uh, try to come up with a understanding of, you know, um, what we would do a, a projection or a best guesstimate of how many students would actually come back um, without being able to contact those families directly. I would expect there to be a bubble coming in next year's kindergarten. It probably would be worthwhile for us to uh, go through the town census and send a mailing out to people in what would have been our kindergarten cohort this year who didn't show up to, to do some sort of a survey or a poll or, a, or, or to, get, you know, to get data on those kids to see where they're gonna be. So mm -hmm. we know what, what we're planning for budgetarily because we might end up with uh, significantly more kindergarten seats needed next year than we do for this year as well. Um, I, would, I would concur with you, Mr. Schluckman, that uh, Mr. Mason is very modest, but I have to say our, our projections have been pretty close to the number in the last few years. Um, and if we were to compare how many students we have in kindergarten compared to our projection, we're looking somewhere in the neighborhood of 40, possibly as high as 50 students that did not choose to start this year. It will be corroborated by the work that um, uh, Mr. Mason's going to do and looking at birth dates. But you're right. You know, we, are, we know we have a, at least 18 to 20 students that, that had registered then withdrew, but I'm expecting a bump next year. And that could be problematic in terms of staffing and classrooms. So we had this happen a couple of years ago. If you remember, we really, we made a big jump. Um, and it was actually up to like 580. And I had talked to uh, Jerry McKibben about this after, and he said what he hadn't figured out was that there were a number of kids that were going to just be held uh, out a year. So it's very possible. Thank you. All right, uh, anything else? Um, the last thing I wanted to mention was that um, the Department of Education sent out a survey last week, last week to districts uh, to get information about structured learning time, and uh, it was, a, it was a, uh, a survey in which you had to say how many hours there was for in both the remote academy and the hybrid, how many hours there were with um, in-person instruction, 
synchronous instruction, asynchronous instruction, um, uh, how, much, how much time was devoted to um, non-instructional time, which included hand washing and math breaks, lunch, et cetera. It was a fairly, uh, um, it was a fairly um, significant time survey, time involving survey because one question could have 50 cells that you had to fill out uh, in this regard. So uh, the, we submitted the data as did all the other districts. Uh, there's going to be an analysis. I have yet to get the, our data back to Proofy because one of the things that happens in the surveys, you couldn't see your, your data entered in the cell. Um, if, if it required two, two digits, you could only see one digit. Uh, so it's very hard to proof it. it. Took me a lot of time to, to do that, but I just wanna let you know that that did happen. I, I think one of the goals was to see if districts were meeting uh, the number of recommended hours of, of structured learning time, which at the secondary level is 5.5 hours out of six and a half in our case. Um, and I can say that we do. We looked at that very carefully. Uh, at the elementary level, it is five hours uh, per day. We do on four of them, but uh, on, the, on Wednesday, we're uh, an hour off of that, but we've been out, but that's been true for a number of years. Uh, we have an early release day. So uh, that, it, I just wanna let you know that that um, was uh, something that the state required, uh, requested. I don't know when they're going to give a report on it. Um, we, I have heard nothing further since last weekend. And that's a conclusion of my report. Great, thank you, Dr. Bodhi. Um, any other questions on the last bit? Okay, um, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which case, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence, vote approval of warrant, warrant number 21091, dated 10 27, 2020, total amount $628,607.95, vote approval of minutes, July 30th, 2020. So moved. Second. Uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am yes. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, we met this past week and we hashed out the budget calendar and started talking about how to get feedback and stuff. That's all. Uh, community relations, Mr. Hainer. Uh, we had our first uh, school committee chat. I think it was. You muted yourself, Mr. Mr. Hainer, we can't hear you. I am. I apologize. No worries. You've got it. Just start over through, again. We want I gotta to go through that whole thing again. Anyway, uh, we had our full, first school committee chat. It went, I thought, extremely well. Uh, eight different parents came in and signed on. For the most part, they talked individually. Uh, there was uh, one or two minor discussions. I did a summary report to the committee, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions with regard to that if you choose. Uh, our next chat is scheduled for this Saturday at 11 o'clock and the follow up one will be on uh, December 5th at 11 o'clock. Great. Uh, Mr. Cardin, CIAA. Uh, so we are meeting on Wednesday at five o'clock to um, go over the report from the high school principal and also uh, to extent we have time to start looking at uh, the draft goals for 20 21. Uh, facilities, Mr. Thielman. Um, I mean, Dr. Brody mentioned earlier that we've got, you know, lots of good news from the high school. Uh, the team has made a lot of progress. We have not, we don't have a meeting scheduled. Um, and I realize we have not spent any time this year on the other buildings uh, other than a report from Mr. Feeney early on. So we'll take a look at that. 
Uh, policy, Mr. Schlickman. A no report. Superintendent search process, Mr. Schlickman. Uh, you know where we're at. Uh, high school building committee, Mr. Gilman. The high school building committee meets on the 17th. Um, we will be voting on what's called the guaranteed maximum price on December 3rd. Um, we'll get reports on the 17th on bids. Um, and everyone got the notice that due to Governor Baker's order, which wasn't quite directly um, impacting what we were doing, but we decided not to have tours uh, and we decided not to have the ceremony on the front of the high school, the first steel ceremony. Um, we'll have a small group from the building committee there on the 23rd to witness the first deal um, and hopefully record it uh, for posterity and for ACMI, I guess. And uh, we'll try to do um, another ceremony uh, for the public uh, later in the year when conditions change. But I will say the building project is moving forward and it's it's moving at a good pace and there's a lot of good news to that we'll get more details on next week. Thank you. We discussed the um, the first steel ceremony. Mr. Thielen will have a crucial role. He will be filmed. It will be broadcast. Um, it, it's going to be in retrospect because ACMI is going to have to put it together, but there will be stuff there to watch and it will be exciting. Super. It will be exciting. It will be exciting. I shouldn't be downplay. It'll be very exciting. And it is, and it is very exciting, by the way. It gives us all hope. You're an exciting person, Jeff. <laughs> All right, liaison reports. Announcements. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, Brewery Club of Arlington uh, placed 158 flags up at the water tower on the top of Park Ave, recognizing heroes throughout the entire community. Uh, the, the, this uh, function is thanks to Mr. Lundstrom and the workplace program and the students uh, they have been uh, a key factor in this every year. They will be flags because of the weather will stay up through uh, 11 up. They'll be taken down at 11 o'clock next Monday. So if you get a chance, take a ch walk up there and walk through the flags. You get to see all the different heroes throughout the town of Arlington. Thank you. Great. Future agenda items. Seeing none. Um, executive session. Uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted AEA. So what do we think? We need to vote to go into executive session, right? So moved. I okay. so moved. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Okay. Oh. Um, great. And we are going to um, adjourn from executive session. So. And I'll second that. Thank you. The adjournment part or the executive session part? Oh, the executive session. Okay. You're usually a fan of adjournment, too. Um, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes.